Hello, welcome along. It is round six of the Telenet Super Prestige Series. This is what Sunday evenings were made for under the floodlights today in Deegan. Welcome along. If you're joining us for the first time in the Super Prestige Series, let's remind ourselves of the races so far. What a season it has been so far. And tonight's start list reads like a veritable who's who of the world of cyclocross. Alongside me, joining me this evening is Helen Wyman. Uh, it's great to have you back with us, Helen. Welcome back. Hello, thank you. Right, let's talk about today's uh, race in uh, Deegan. It's quite special, isn't it? We don't often get to see everyone under the floodlights. No, it's really rare in cyclocross. We used to have it in America in Cross Vegas, but and Nack Van Warden is the only other one I can think of. But this is a completely different atmosphere. It's one of the wildest races, and everyone should go spectate once in their lifetime. <laughs> I can imagine in Belgium it's a little bit bonkers by this time of the day. Normally, with the uh, the amount of beer that they they bring in for, uh, for a race like this. There are a lot of drunk people, that is for sure. <laughs> the big party. Let's have a look at the standings, though, going in to this evening's race, the Telenet Super Prestige Series, uh, one of the uh, most prestigious in the world. And as we see, Celine Del Carmen Alvarado leading with 67 points, ahead of Yara Kastelein, Sana Kant up there as well, Azufi Wurst, Lechner, Van Looy, Van Van der Heiden and Manon Backer. quite when you look at that so far though Helen the the likes of Yara Kastelein is up there the beginning part of this season she's been definitely one of the revelations so far she's been there and thereabouts for the last couple of seasons but she had a phenomenal start to the season she looks like she struggled in the last few races though yeah, I think she peaked quite early for this season and she's probably planning a second peak for Worlds. And we all knew how good she was when she was 16 years old. She could ride things that other riders couldn't. And uh, it's just been that she's had a lot of bad luck and injuries and things over the last three or four years. And now she's coming of age. Um, and it's really exciting to see. At, at Celine Del Carmen Alvarado, when we kind of cast our minds back to the beginning of this year, the, the race in Brussels at Brussels University, that was sort of a breakthrough victory for her. And she's just been utterly outstanding so far this season. She looks like the way her form is very, 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 very consistent throughout the, the first part of the year with sort of two months to go. Yeah, so... I think at the World Championships last year, it was a bit of a shock that she didn't win the under-23s. And that might have been the spur that she needed to actually think, OK, I need to change things. How am I going to do this? And also, she's become older and another year of training. But this summer, she's gone away and she's a fantastic runner now. She's really confident in how she's riding. And it's really exciting to see her grow during the season. You saw in Table World Cup how good she was at holding that wheel. And it was literally who made the most mistakes in those races. And it makes for really exciting races. And recently, she's just gone off the front and, and won by a lot. <laughs> um, but yeah, I think tonight it will be a lot closer battles. All right, going talking about evenings, our uh, intrepid junior reporter Zoe Backstead has been out and about meeting the riders as she caught up with Ruby Miller, Fionn James and Magali Rochette a little bit earlier on today. I'm here with Magali Rochette. Um, Magali, 
How do you have to prepare for a race being in the evening as opposed to the daytime? It's a little different, but what I like to do is kind of start back, like kind of count backwards. So I start with the race and normally I always eat about three hours before. So that's what I do. And then I kind of switch the day a little bit. Um, it helps if you can get a little nap in the, during the day. And then like I do, uh, I drink coffee like an hour and a half before trying to, I don't know, really drink coffee at night, but now you have to, you have to be awake. So I guess like those details and other than that, I mean, it's pretty much the same. It's just more exciting because it's at night, I think. Yeah. Um, how are you feeling going into today's race? Because you've done a few races out here already, a few of the World Cups. Um, yeah, how are you feeling? I'm feeling good. I had two good races at the World Cups where I was, I mean, Namora wasn't feeling that good, but I had a good race. Then Zolder, I was feeling super good. I just completely messed up the start, but then I was feeling great. Um, and Luna, Lunu, that was really, really bad. But um, I'm feeling good now and I'm excited. It's my last race in Europe before going back home. And then I'll come back in January. But for now, it's the last one. So it makes it even more, I don't know, there's a little yeah. oomph with that one. So it's fun. Um, and do you have any pre-race rituals that you do? Yeah, it's not really a ritual, but um, I do always take like about two minutes to kind of breathe and remind myself what I'm about to do. Because sometimes like there's so much get go so much going around you and it's easy to get caught up in the chaos. So for me, like taking two minutes to like, all right, breathe. All right, I'm here. All right, it's going to be a start. That's just what the start is like. Just reminding myself what I'm about to do. Um, that helps me to kind of get back into it. So th that's really my only ritual. I don't, un unfortunately, I don't have anything like super special, but yeah, that's the only thing. Thank you. So we'll catch up with Ruby and Fiona a little bit later. We're getting a little bit tight towards the uh, the start of the race. So we'll, uh, we'll go down as soon as we've got live pictures. We'll go over to the start line. Don't forget, subscribe to GCN Racing. Just hit that subscribe button. Hit that bell icon. And subscribe. It doesn't cost you anything. It's free to subscribe. If you want more live free cyclocross here on GCN Racing, it's a big help to us if you can just hit that subscribe uh, button. And you can also hit your notifications. It means you can plan your broadcast as well. And you'll just get a notification about 30 minutes before we go live. So if you could do that, that would be a big help to us. We are down on the start line. Alice Maria Azufi alongside her. Katie Compton, Magali Rochette, we, uh, we heard from. You can see how she's wearing the, uh, the red uh, Canadian national champions jersey. Sana Camp, the world champion. Clara Hunsinger in the background. Celine Del Carmen Alvarado, Anna Marie Horst, Yara Kastelein, the European champion. And then Inga van der Heiden. Lights are red. We are almost uh, ready to race here in Deegan. They're uh, under orders. The, uh, the commissaire right there, poised and ready. The anticipation of the riders. Very, very uh, fast lap that we've got here in Deegan. Sana Kant, multiple winner of this race over the years. She was the winner last year. And we are away. We are off and racing. Katie Compton on your left there. Alicia Maria Azufi just dropping back. It's Celine Del Carmen Alvarado, though, that leads out from Anna Woody first. Anna K. Well, up there towards the front. Magali Rochette gets a great start. Blanca Katavas from Hungary also well to the front. A really big field of riders that we've got. We've got 109 on the start line. One of them, Helen, is Pauline Ferron Prevo. A lot of excitement and anticipation around the French rider back into uh, cross action. Definitely. And this part of the course, that after you've started, it gets crazy. And with 109 riders on that start line, it's going to be carnage from 20th place down. So it's so, so important to get a really good start here. It is, and you already saw Celine Del Carmen Alvarado just uh, kicking it off the front, going through there. Emmy Perryman from Hargroves Montezumas. And the riders just getting tangled up as they are a little bit further down the back. Now we go on to this big off camber section here, Helen. Bit of a famous part of the course, this bank. This has definitely caused a few issues in the past, and you can see there on the right hand side that I think that's Katie Compton just taking out Eva Lechner. Um, Evie Richards jumps off and rides around her. And this section, again, is so, so important to be at the front of the race on the first lap, particularly in this race and particularly when there are so many riders. 
Minu American champion there, just uh, skipping along the top, back to the front, round the side of the football pitch, and it's uh, Alvarado that leads out from Anamani Worst. Quite an ominous sight already as Magali Rochette just rounds that corner. She's got the Christmas lights on the helmet again as uh, Magali Rochette. Then comes Sana Kant, Lara of a Donshot, Blanca Catavas, Evie Richards, Yara Castelline, Anna Kay, and then a little bit of a gap now back to, uh, it looked like Azufi with Lechner not far behind. Yeah, this is a really good start as well by Magali. She hasn't had a start this good in Europe yet this year. Obviously in America she did when she won the World Cup in Iowa, but that's a, a really, you need to be in a, a really good place here. And as long as there's a group forming, we saw last year with Denise Betsema shutting the gap on the last lap, you know, it's, it's something that um, you can easily do on this course because there's so much road. And in terms of this course, you were telling me before the, the percentage of, uh, of tarmac to, to what we'd call traditional cross surfaces here is quite, is quite a lot. It's quite outstanding, yeah. It's, so the course is 3.4 kilometres, roughly long, and one kilometre of that is road. 500 metres of that is gravel, and the rest is either off-road or obstacles like stairs and woods and things like that. So a third of this course is hard-packed ground. You could ride on a road bike, basically. So there's your chasing group, Anna K, number 51, on to the back as uh, Rochette just gets up to our two leaders, the Canadian champion, Sanakant and Yara Kastelein trying to get in there. Verdonskot from Pal and Bingo just closing that gap down. Kastelein comes straight over the top of the world champion. Good to see that European champion's jersey getting herself up there. Kastelein, as we said, has had a few issues in the last couple of races. Zonhoven, Namur, not the sort of courses that were uh, really uh, suiting her. Didn't look particularly comfortable. She'll be looking for a bit of a morale boost here as our Zufi, Van der Heiden go through. Then Van Anroy. There's Pauline Ferran Fravo wearing number 109 here. Pauline Ferran Fravo just uh, she Helen. The only thing she can do is what she's doing is just try and pick her way through this field of riders and get as far up <laughs> as she can. Yeah, I mean right now you see Katie Scott there uh, on the left hand side. She you know she started at the back, so that's what happens when you don't have UCI points and you have to not go too hard, but you do have to take opportunities to overtake. And this road section is one of the best opportunities. We've seen Yara this year. Hasn't, her skills haven't entirely matched her ability and you find that a lot when riders get a lot better quickly you find that you suddenly hit things that you didn't were coming at you faster than you've ever they've ever come at you before and so sometimes that's why we've seen her crash a lot lately um, but I'm fairly sure within a couple of races she'll be on top of that again. So thanks to all of you for checking in. So Jamie Adelete over on the YouTube forum. What do we mean by off Canberra? It's off Canberra. It's my accent. Sorry, it'll be my uh, my Hampshire accent. <laughs> off Canberra, and off Canberra means the uh, the the bank slopes away rather than uh, yes, off cam, off not off camera. Into the woods in this section. Uh, Evie Richards as well. Good to see Evie uh, back in racing. Blanca Catavas. Uh, the, when you look through this season, we saw her really emerge at Koppenberg, and, and it, it, it is great to see another flag getting up there with the, the national champion of Hungary. Yeah, and interestingly, she got third in, second sorry, in Essen this year, and that was the only time she started from the front row. So I think that she's a really good starter as well, which we just don't get the opportunity to see that because of her world ranking. She's obviously not there. Rochette just goes left through the sand. Alvarado latches back onto the wheel there of Anamari Hoer. So that right, those two riders really uh, nail that section. Castelline going through. Then Sana Kant. Then the big group here. There's Puck Peters there. It's, uh, riders will just go back here to Pauline Ferran Fravo. Uh, Letizia Borghese right behind her. And we'll just run you through some other your other riders that you uh, haven't quite seen there. There's your American champion, Clara Honsinger. We have pointed her out. Nadia Heigl is here for our Austrian fans. For the Czech Republic, Nick, uh, Nikola Bajgarova is here. Fionn James, Rebecca Gross and Cora Kugan Cisek, Emily Werner from the US, uh, Michelle Gagan from Ireland, uh, Siobhan Kelly from uh, Canada. We've also got Abby May Parkinson, Laura Greenhouse, uh, Ruby Miller in there. We've got Cambry Epperson. 
The uh, Annick Van Alphen is on the start today. Madigan Monroe, Katie Scott, Helen just mentioned, Har Har Hannah Aronsman, Lizzie Gonzalez is uh, on the start wearing 64 today. Uh, the winner of uh, the Helen 100, uh, the Sophie Thackray, Kelly Lawson from Canada, Lauren Zerner from the US, Maddie Wadsworth, Amy Perriman, Michaela Thompson, Abby Manley also here, another Canadian, Clara Stichuk. Mary Lynn, and uh, we've also of our Italian fans, Giada Borghese is also in there. Ishbel Strathby, uh, Roshan Lally, uh, we've got Lotta Mansfield, Lily Young, Chloe Hinchcliffe, Emily Ashwood, uh, we've got um, uh, Amelia Pell from Hargroves, Montezuma's in there as well for other American viewers, Elena Diaz, Riley Moshe, Skylar Bovin as well, and Samantha Runnels. That's, uh, it's kind of when I look at down the start, it's probably easier to pick out the Belgians and the Dutch today compared to the, uh, <laughs> the Americans and the, and the Brits and the other nations. Uh, Sana Kant off that cobble section, back on to the grass. Our leading group kicking on. Amazing how uh, much that little sand section uh, made a difference there, Helen. Yeah, we saw how um, Yara jumped off, but she took the riders behind her off with her. And that's what you really want to... If, if you don't feel that you're able to do something, that's what you really want to do. And uh, we saw Lucinda Brown do that to Celine quite a lot in the Coxsider World Cup. So it's, you know, for Yara, it was a smart move. But for Sana, unfortunately, it does mean that she's lost that group. In this race, it's so, so important to follow a decent wheel. Um, and it's so important to follow a strong wheel on the uphill and never see the headwind, basically. Evie Richards and Anna Kay not far away. Shirin Van Anroy is uh, not far away from the front as well of this one out of that corner. So it's Alvarado, Hurst and Castelline, Coronet Circus with rider Alvarado with two triple seven riders here as they uh, go into that section. Castelline gets the inside line, as you said right before on the sand there, Helen. <laughs> you, if you're going to go down, you've got to take out slow everyone behind you. Interestingly, on this section of the course, um, in pre-ride, Sana Kant was pre-riding earlier in the day in daylight and she hit some stones and she asked the organisers to go back and remove them and they dug up four little massive rocks from the middle of the course. So up the steps, that sure uh, shows you into the finish as they uh, exit the steps and up the fi up towards the finish line eight minutes and 43 rider goes uh, katie compton goes straight over the top there katie compton not having uh, any kind of luck today no she's really struggling in these conditions she had a fantastic ride um, in loon out two days ago so um sometimes super fast courses like this and um, wheel holding you have to get used to it again if you haven't been we haven't really seen it as much this year as we saw it in previous seasons so for katie as you're an older rider, it's much harder to be that fast, basically. Out of that corner, so a lot of riders. Hopefully the 80% uh, the rule works well today. Out there, Anna Kay just comes up on the inside of Magali Rochette there. Let's go back to Pauline Ferron Prevost. And uh, she's got uh, Madigan Munro for company. Just right alongside her onto this uh, off camber bank section. And Alvarado nails that one perfectly. Castelline being uh, delaying here and her teammate behind. And that is, uh, you don't need to give uh, Celine Alvarado any uh, two invitations uh, to get a gap like that. No, you really don't. And some riders you want to follow, some riders you don't. And uh, Celine, you really want to follow as close as humanly possible. And that's a, a bit of a shame for Amory Wars there because now she's gapped as well. Although Yara was really strong on the last uphill and closed the gap. So potentially she can do that again. She can out of that corner. The two triple seven riders here can work together to get back. A few of you asking about Lucinda Brand um, after the weekend. She's doing OK. This is the uh, rider there that just uh, delayed Katie Compton. Francesca Baroni. Compton goes down behind her. And, uh, Lucinda Brand that went down uh, heavily. Uh, on the uh, on the bridge section she's uh, had some stitches in her knee she's uh, been on social media just saying that she's uh, going to take some time to recover managed a few rides over the uh, the last couple of days and then she'll uh, look to try and come back uh, strongly Castelline closes that gap back up now to Selena Alvarado as they go around the side of the pitches here looking good this uh, trio of leaders it's very hard to get a gap in this race as well. So for um, 
Celine, even though she pushed on because she had that pressure, she then put pressure, she had that gap, sorry, she then put pressure on the riders behind them and they had to put their energy in to come back. And there's only so many times you can do that, but equally they are coming back and they do that a lot in this race because there's so much road. It is, and they call Courtright the Urban Cross. It's not, it's not far away yeah. really, is it? No, no, that's a lot. And Sana Kant, Sana's can she close it? Yeah, she's looking good. I was just about to say, Sana Kant uh, won this race uh, last year from Annemarie Kostanese, Betzma, Ava Lechner, Mount Captains, Laura Vadon. She got Nikki Bramia, Christine Majera, Selena Alvarado here was ninth, and Yolanda Neff was tenth. Got to see. Got to send a big shout out as well to Yolanda Neff, who had a really uh, serious crash on her mountain bike uh, a day or so ago. Um, so uh, we wish uh, Yolanda all the all the best in her uh, recovery. Head of the race, worst focused there. Can Sana can't get back into this group, the world champion again. Helena, the, the um, world champion here, Sana can't. It's the last couple of weeks. She looked as well. She came into the season with a with a lot of form to find, and, and now the last couple of weeks is starting to look a bit more like herself. She is. I know she changed her coach this year, and sometimes it takes a long time to get used to that coach. So I think that might be what the thing is. But also, she's probably peaking for Worlds again, and we've seen that the quality and the number of riders that are capable of beating her is much higher now than in previous years. And so probably your focus really has to be on Worlds rather than a, a continuous season that's really good. Castelline oh. just gets kicked across to the left as Samarkand out of that the corner. Uh, Shirin Van Anroy not far away. Again, Shirin Van Anroy, we, uh, again, last couple of seasons, just steady, steady progress. Had a great road season, took that European Junior Time Trial title, got a medal at the World uh, Junior Time Trial as well but as these young riders the likes of uh, Blanca Catavas and Shirin Van Anroy juniors uh, in effect Puck Peterson as well that are all up there they're just at the, the future is really really bright when you look at riders like Shirin that are right here right behind the world champion yeah you see them in the really fast races as well so races like this this really suits Inga van der Heiden there in the orange kit of CCC just behind Shirin and they, they suit the young riders because they're super fast, they're quite technical, but they're also holding a wheel. And these riders are learning how to ride at the front of a race, which is really good for their progression in the future. And then you see them in the muddy races and they're a lot further back like Narman. But equally, that is a super tough race. And so basically the strongest are the older riders and the strongest will win those races. Although Selena is still young, she's only 22. What's your thoughts as well on, on on Selena Alvarado and her decision to want to get that Europe that world to ride the world under twenty three championships rather than than race for the elite? Is that a good move? Do you think by her to just tick that one off before she decides to move up to that elite championship? I think it's a very sensible move. I think she didn't win last year. If she had won last year, potentially she would have moved up. But why wouldn't you? I mean, it's. A win's a win and a world championship win. It could be that the elite world championships for the women is much harder to call. So your chances are higher in the under 23s this year. But in the future, obviously, as you get stronger, your chances rise in the elite. So why wouldn't you take that opportunity and become under 23 world champion if, again, if you're capable of it? Pauline Ferrand Provo, she's got uh, man, on ba uh, man on backer and uh, Maria Norbert Riberola not far behind her. Your two chasers just off the back of this group, Sana Kant and Inga van der Heiden, the CCC live rider, just uh, the uh, under 23 world champion. That's impressive that Shirin's just got back to that front group and left those other two riders behind. Phenomenal move there by the uh, Team 185 rider to get onto this. Gives us four riders at the head of the race. So looking good here. So there's Sonakant, Inga van der Heide, and then you've got Alice Maria Azufi and Blanka Katavas, the champion of Hungary. Not far away, Sonakant just kicks it out of that corner now, just tries to get onto the back of the group. Shows it's fairly chilly here this evening as well when, uh, when you see Sonakant with the leg warmers on. It's actually been pretty chilly today. The wind's been uh, cold as well, and we had like a bit of a frost last night, a bit of ice last night. So um, it's it was around four degrees during the day, so it'd probably feel about two or three degrees right now. And you get really hot when you're racing. Your heart rate's really high, but 
equally, there are descents, road descents on this course that uh, it's just like being on the road, basically, in a road race. Anna Marie Huerst leading out, right, right behind that group. Here's uh, Licia Maria Azufi. She's got Ava Lechner now, has made it up to this chasing group. So makes that three chasers behind. Uh, Van Anroy, a little dab of the foot there with Alvarado. I think they might be using um, probably Griffo's, maybe Baby Limits at the most here because the course is so, so much road, as we said. Um, and the woods and things, you don't really need much traction. So when you do get to the slippery sections like this, where Eva just put her, to put her foot down, um, you don't have the same traction that you'd have if you'd used a mud tread. So going out at that corner, you're seeing it tonight. Puck Peterson is in uh, ZZPR.nl hand clean orange babies that she rides for. There's uh, Ellen Van Loy and uh, Evie Richards into that uh, deep muddy section. Alvarado learns from the previous lap, decides to run that whole section, then gets into the steps of the makings of a really uh, quality leading group here. Asana Kant is not far away. Back to Azufi Lechner, Blanca Katavas and Puck Peterson just Getting on to the back of this group just gets kicked across to the left and they're not far away from this group now as Anna Kay just comes round that corner back up towards the line and they cross there 17 minutes and 27 seconds so you've got uh, Anna Winnie Quirst, Yara Castellan, Alvarado, Van Anroy, Van der Heide and Sana Kamp. that's your top six Magali Rochette just dropping back a little bit she's just behind Evie Richards so it's our Zufi is gonna go through in seventh Ava Lechner in eighth, uh, Blanca Katavas, Puck Peterson, and then Anna Kay, and then a bit of a gap now back to Ellen Van Loy, Evie Richards, and Magali Rochette. So Anna Kay just outside the top 10, 23 seconds back, back, back to Puck Peterson there in 10th uh, place. Puck, one of those riders, Helen, that's been out there. She raced in that first round of the Helen 100. She wanted to be able to, to show off that European Junior Champions jersey that she worked so hard to get. She did, yeah. That's really exciting to see that the young riders, it really means something to them and they don't get an opportunity. She's a second year junior, so she won't get that opportunity to use to wear that jersey in World Cups next year. She'll be in it under 23. So, yeah, it's really, really exciting to see. Shirin chose to take the low line there and run because obviously she came into the group last in that group of five. But I really think it's a lot slower. So even when riders get held up behind, you can see Azufi isn't going fast there. Um, it's still actually faster to stay on your bike in this situation. Yara Castelline just carrying her speed up towards that corner, looking to get the momentum to get back on to this group. Shirin Van Anroy just riding the coattails of uh, Yara Castelline. Van der Heiden, a bit of work to do now to get back on to this group. Sana Khan, again, you just get that little sort of uh, slingshot effect um, at the moment through uh, this course, Helen. It's it's very tight in, in and out, very lots of twists and turns, lots of corners. That group just kind of came together on, on the steps and then back into those technical sections just split yet again nobody really wants to take it on at the front on the the open sections like this because there's no advantage to being on the front you're not seeing lines that other people aren't you're not slowing other riders down for an obstacle you're literally just riding in a straight line uphill back to Pauline Ferrand Prevost and then Clara Honsinger is right behind her and for Pauline coming back into uh, cross racing at this level can it sometimes take you a little while to maybe just find your groove a little bit again it absolutely can in the super fast races and this one will be another super fast race so for her she's racing against riders that have already been doing this for three months now and they've been used to this we did we saw Zolder was 25k an hour average speed for the elite women which is something that I can't even do on an e-bike right now <laughs> in my <laughs> normal road ride. So it's for, for Prevo, it's a lot. Although she's changing bikes, so I feel like she might have a problem. Takes a fresh bike, calling for on Prevo. She's been quite um, the last few weeks as well, just saying that she's now decided to concentrate on a, on a cyclocross and, and mountain bike program, leaving, leaving the road behind. Yeah, that's really exciting to see. I mean, she is so good on the uh, mountain biking and mountain biking is an Olympic discipline. So she does get the opportunity to go for her Olympic medals and she loves cross and cross has that effect on a lot of people. You see how much Mariana loves it, that she just can't let it go. Um, and 
yeah, cross really, when you're in there, in that racing, it's really exciting racing. You, you're doing things that you don't feel your bike should be capable of. It's good to see there that Anna's staying in the same position, even though she hasn't had a, a wheel to follow for a while now. She's coming back up to Lechner and hopefully she'll be able to get on because you really want to save as much energy as possible in this race. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. There's your leading five just going into that corner from as we uh, exit there and go into the woods. Yara Castellan had a bit of an uh, issue previous lap. Zana Kant again just trying to get herself back in. Van Anroy has to get off and run on the, that section. Zana Kant, a little dab of that foot as she goes uh, up that section. Inga van der Heiden over the top of there as uh, the world champion tries to come back here again a lot of you uh, over on the chats just loving that long uh, aerial shot from the cable cam van anroy after that work to get on she now has to uh, kick to get back on to uh, this group what this this period of racing over the over the festive period helen it must after a while is this the, can deem sometimes be that point where the f the accumulative fatigue of Namur and Houston Zolder and learn how and those sort of races just really start to bite into your legs it can a little bit um not quite yet normally around ball time you're thinking oh I'm so glad I've only got two races left um but Degum is a fast race like I say I've said a lot obviously um and so it doesn't take it out of you as much as a, a muddy loon out or Baal is an incredibly tough race, so when they get to that race, we'll see big gaps. We won't see bunch racing like we're seeing here, for sure. Sana can into the sand. Everyone just roaring her on from the side. The eco Creelan rider just out of that section. There's your gap back now to Alicia Maria Azufi. Blanca Katavas, Puck Peterson and Ava Lechner, the next riders there as Anna Kay just tries to get back on to uh, that group behind. Cruel, cruel, you could almost say here, Helen, a little bit cruel placement of the of the planks there out, out of that corner. They're, they're really trying to prevent riders from uh, from trying to bunny hop those. I think they look a little bit higher because Anna's been, Anna Kay's been jump bunny hopping them all year. P Puck Peters has been bunny hopping them all year. Um, and Ick Van Alpen too. So I think they might have like, if you look at the front one, it looks like there's a bit of wood underneath it um, and it's slightly raised. So potentially they're trying to make it more epic so less men can jump them. They're trying to force them off and run. Look at the effort on the face here of Sana Kant as she tries to get back up to that group once. Another victory in this one. When you go through the years, Mariana Voss in 2011, 2012, it was Katarina Nash that took this uh, Sana Kant in 2013. Back to Mariana Voss in 2014. Ellen Van Loy took a victory in 2015. Back to Mariana Voss in 2016. Then 17 and 18, it's been this rider, Sana Kant. But as Helen said a little bit early on, now the strength in numbers, the challenges to Sana Kant, where we're, uh, we're so used to are just picking up up victory after victory throughout the season she has so much more competition the camera goes back again to Pauline Ferran Provo, Laura Vidonskot and uh, Clara Honsinger in that group behind if if this comes down to a sprint uh, Helen out of those uh, out of those steps a lot of the time it can just come down to uh, the, the remount, isn't it? Making sure you got no mud in the shoes coming out of that, that uh, after that muddy section. In this race, you really have to be in the front just before you hit that little alleyway. So you've just gone around the um, S bends and then you hit an alleyway and then you do another bit of road before you come into this section. And as long as you lead all of this, all out of the road, all up the steps, then you can get a gap. Um, and we saw that's what Sana did last year to win this race. We've seen it lots of times in the past. So it's not necessarily the stairs, which is the important part. It's actually 400 meters before that you just want to make sure you're controlling that race. And it's a lot harder to come around a rider than it is to lead from the front to win the sprint. Alvarado, you saw just opened up a little bit of a gap. Yara Castellan was having none of that and closed it back down. Here's your chasing group. Blanca Katavas, Pizza, Azufi, K, and Lechner is your next group on the road. Selena Alvarado gets kicked uh, across again. She tried to ride a little bit more of that section than she did the previous lap. Shirin Van Anroy in the back of the group, shoulders the bike, sprints up alongside as Hoyos just has a, a little uh, clip of the foot there and goes uh, has to dab down with the, with the hand. 
You see how these riders are trying to ride as much as possible in that little section? Because it's one of those awkward things where if you can ride and you can ride around the corner, you don't have as far to run because you've got to run the flat between the steps. There's no point in getting back on and off again. On to lap three of uh, lap four of five that we are on now for you. They're uh, looking for your lap time. So 26 minutes and 11 seconds is your time gap. Sana Camp going through the uh, the finish line this time at uh, 15, 16 seconds that they round it up to. A really select leading group here. Horst Alvarado, Castellan, Van Anroy, the young junior rider, back to the chasers. Blanca Katavas of Hungary, Puck Peterson goes through. They've opened a little advantage now over Arzufi as Anna K just tries to come through just ahead of uh, Ava Lechner. So 33 and 35 seconds respectively back to those chasers. Sana's doing a lot of work in this race today. She normally likes to sit on and then win from a sprint, but those girls at the front are just that little bit too fast that she can't quite stay there. As Alvarado oh. loses it there, worst can she uh, seize the opportunity? Anna Marie Horst, I'm sure, will have a glance back here. That just shows that off camber section and uh, just uh, how tricky it can be. Watch this. As soon as a wheel drops out of that rut, you no longer have traction. And basically, you just slide down the hill until you hit the next rut, um, which isn't what you really want, because eventually <laughs> you end up hitting the tape. And as we said, Alan Muri Horst now has seen that there's an opportunity as Puck Peterson drops down to that bottom line. Anna Kay rides the uh, high section, the aerial uh, cable cam shot here that we've got. And Marie Horst is attacked at the front after Celine Del Carmen Alvarado, that little mistake. Yeah, Anna Marie has had a phenomenal season so far. Kicks it over the top of the bridge now. Can they bring it back? Alvarado, you can see now that, uh, that attack behind to try and close that gap down. Yeah, I think, it, I think the gaps will come back again together. Um, they always seem to do that in this race just because someone's really, really strong on the road. Evie Richards from Trek Factory Racing, your next rider on the course. So Evie looking good here. He's, uh, back to the front, back to the head of the race. There's the uh, the camera shot, just foreshortens it very slightly, but Alvarado has a look back at Shirin Van Anroy that's sitting here in third place with uh, Castelline not far away. And then a bit of a gap back to Inga van der Heiden. Lap four of five that we're on here. If you're just joining us today, this evening, welcome. It's the night race here in Deegan, round six of the Telenet Super Prestige Series. And uh, the general classification, Selena Alvarado, the rider here in second place in the white and red of Corandon Circus. She leads overall from the rider in the European Champions jersey, Yara Castelline. 67 points that she has in the general classification. Castelline with 63. Sana Kant third with 53. Anna Marie Horst here is in fifth place. Just behind her teammate, Alice Maria Azufi. Ava Lechner is uh, sixth overall. Ellen Van Looy seventh with 38. Laura Vidonshot is eighth at 31. Inga van der Heiden is ninth with 30 points and Manon back a 10th with 27 points that is your general classification here in the super prestige series and such there's also, a prestigious race to win this one there's also an under 23 category this year with prize money which is a first for the women but good to add that into the mix. Alvarado, oh, can she carry that speed through this section and get back on to Anna Marie Horst? Gets a good line there. Alvarado does the same. Castellines had a few issues on previous laps. She manages to uh, stay on that one. So does Shirin Van Anroy. All going for that right-hand line out of that corner. You can see the junior rider here from Team 185 really digging deep here to try and uh, get back up. They really try and cut the course, so it looks quite, it doesn't look very steep, but it's actually really steep, as you can see the, the girls are pushing quite quite hard on the gears there, but if you're able to ride, keep your speed around the outside, like you said, and then cut to the left, if you cut to the left, you take the angle out of the hill, and so it means that you only need to do one little push over the top, and then you're okay again. So that uh, leading group just coming back together with three riders. Cam Van Anroy giving another charge to get back up there. 
Castelline, is she going to make a little bit of a move down the outside as she gets back on to the group with her teammate on the front? That little attack there by anybody worse. She'll just take a little bit of an opportunity here just to allow herself to recover after that attack as they exit that corner and hit the sand. And they, she really wants to be into that sand pit first. If you can control the speed, you can make, yeah, Anne-Marie's just had to get off. And so instantly she's lost a couple of meters and she's going to have to put a lot of effort in to come back again. And it, there's only so much energy that you can expend in a race. So you can see her there out of the saddle straight away having to, to come back. I think you'll find that on the last... Oh, shirin has got a problem. Shirin Van Anroy hand up there to the uh, mechanics in the pits just to let her know that she's got an issue and needs uh, a change of bike, a back tyre. Maybe a back tyre there looking a little bit flat. Oh, the mechanics aren't there's ready. There's no bike. There's oh, no bike. Oh, you're joking. It's a double pit in Deegan. And there's no bike up there for her. Oh, bless her. That's and not what you stopped. want, is it? And, and, and the UCI rules are that if you stop, you have to change or get a mechanical to carry on. But, oh, that's a disaster. Oh, not what you want to see. A flat back tyre there for Shearing Van Anroy. And again, that shows the difference between... Uh, in teams in, in terms of how many bikes that, that you've got available and they let her go what a shame I mean, after that effort and it's good to uh, I mean <laughs> just changing the subject it's good to see Puck Peters there riding the barriers and we'll see if Anna Kay does the same yeah, yeah she does there. but that I think Sometimes when you're a rider, you choose in a race where there's two separate pits, which are very rare. So here, Koppenberg are the only two I can think of right now off the top of my head. Um, you choose a pit specifically based on, on what you think the problem would be or where the best way to change is if you do need to change. But sometimes you don't have enough staff to, to manage all the pits. So you can't send someone to the top pit because you've only got one mechanic or maybe two mechanics, but you need them both in the same location. But she should have known that there was no one there. Or she and again, was that just comes with time and experience, would you say? You, you know, as a young rider, she's only a junior rider. It's, it's getting used to that, isn't it? And just trying to sometimes, I know it's difficult just to try and control that emotion sometimes. Um, I feel like her mechanic would have, should have told her where they were going to be. <laughs> um, I would always know where Steph was going to be in a race. So either they told her they'd be there and they're not, and she thought they would be. Um, yeah, so I'm going to say that's probably not her fault on this occasion. Yeah, that's it. When you, from teams that like Coronet Circus or Triple Seven and Sheeran's that sort of rider that those are the teams that will be looking to, to bring her into the, into the mix where you start to have enough bikes to be able to have three bikes and two bikes in that pit or two bikes in, in another pit. Yeah, most of these riders will have a minimum of three bikes, um, lots of sets of wheels. I know in the Experza team, they have three bikes each, eight sets of wheels that are all theirs, um, and then other team wheels. So I know that in this race for them, they would have one in each, um, and there's enough mechanics to share out and people to catch your bikes and things. After all that effort, heartbreaking to see, and there are trio at Castelline, Alvarado and Fuerst just exit the steps, and they will come up to the finish line this time and get the bell. Are we going to have a sprint from this group? Inga van der Heiden sprints through that muddy section. She'll shoulder the bike on the steps. Yara Castelline, little hand to her teammate on the side. I'd say looking at this group and looking at form so far this season, Castelline and Alvarado will not want to come down to a sprint with Anna Marie Hurst out of that corner. What would you say? Yeah, we saw in one of the other Super Prestige races that Anne Marie Wars just beat Celine. We saw in Zolder that Lucinda Brand led from the front and Celine wasn't able to come round her. So potentially sprinting isn't something that she's really confident of. But like I say, it's in this race, it's so, so important to get into that last off-road section in the lead where you can control it. And they'll be fighting for the sandpit and then they'll be fighting for the last corners where we saw Sana pull a move on the group last year. Ava Lechner here, uh, Puck Pizza, Alicia uh, Maria Azufi is the next rider, and Anna Kay's Anna got, Kay's got, got, got a an problem. Issue. There's so something wrong. this time, Ava Lechner kicks on through the line, Anna Kay, maybe a gear issue that she's got there? I feel like she doesn't have a chain. We'll have a look when we go back to that one. Anna Kay, it looks like she's... Uh, yeah, you're completely right there, Helen. 
That's a good spot from that oh. distance. Oh, what a shame. It's the way that you're riding, so you can't actually pedal. You can just scoot, basically. Um, and there's very few situations where that happens, other than uh, a rat, uh, your chain's all jammed up in your rear mech, but then quite often you can't ride at all. Um, or, yeah, your chain snapped. Yara Castellan, we've seen her carrying that speed along that section, lap after lap throughout this race. It's the final lap here in uh, Degum, Alvarado, Hurst and Castellan as Castellan tries to get onto the group. I'd say she needs to put in a big attack now if she can, Yara a cast line to try and get clear of these two riders onto the off camber section Lechner pizza as Zufi as pizza has to just uh, use her momentum to drop down to the bottom of the bank as uh, Blanca Catavas also does the same as Zufi and Kant stay on the bikes and just losing a little bit more time there our trio of uh, leaders worst is uh, in the wheel got a good view now of Celine Alvarado yeah, none of these riders are going to want to go to the front. And uh, with the two triple seven riders in there, Celine shouldn't really be riding the front of this race either. She should be making one of those riders do the work. Pauline Ferron Provo, cameras go back. Manon Backer, then Clara Honsinger right behind her. And then uh, it looks like uh, is that Katie Compton that's just uh, coming into your uh, pictures here. Alvarado leading out. What a uh, season she is having so far. And what a super prestige series we have all the way back to Heaton. And it was uh, Alvarado that took that one. Our Zufi in Bohm, Castellan in Havre. Then we had Alvarado in Rudevorda, then Zonhoven. It was Anna-Marie Horst that took that one. And now Yara Castellan attacked, said she would probably want to try and get away from these two riders uh, looking at form so far this season. Anna-Marie Horst, you would say, is the best sprinter out of this group. But Alvarado, very vigilant, straight on to the attack here of uh, Yara Castellan as Anna Kay makes it into the pits and uh, changes bikes after losing her chain. Here's Shirin Van Anroy just getting in there as well. She had quite, uh, quite a run on that uh, flat tire to get back to the pits yeah that's a really really long way that's such a shame for both young riders that they could have had a really good result again here tonight at this point uh, Celine Del Carmen Alvarado needs to be quite careful of the riders behind as well so the second wheel is the best place to sit in a group um, in the technical sections now Celine's obviously come in front there because she wants to try and control this next section as well but second wheel is you're not going too hard you're being able to follow a wheel and you're able to just control what happens and, and there she's just made uh, Yara make a mistake and they've taken both of them out the back. Sensible move there by Celine Alvarado. She uh, may have seen that Yara Castellan had had issues on that section previously and she kicks on here. Castellan managed to delay her teammate Anna Marie Horst. The two triple seven riders have uh, now got some work to do to try and get back to Alvarado. But Alvarado, you can see they're already kicking on here. That attack by the Corandon Circus rider. Perfectly timed move as she glances to her left just to see where those chasers uh, are behind. Helen, for Alvarado, she would have been making mental notes throughout this race if she'd been behind Castelline um, through previous laps to see that she would have had an issue on that section. Yes, definitely. And that's what makes for a smart bike racer. You need to watch what's going on around you. That's what Sano is so good at. Um, and you need to take advantage of that. Yara is so strong at the minute that every time you get into a straight, she just brings the gap back. But... Like I said, they're about to go into the sand pit and Celine's in the front and that's what she really wanted to be. That's the position she wanted to be in at this point in the race. So Celine Del Carmen Alvarado leads out. Yara Castellan uh, makes it back with Anna Marie Horst. You'd say I, I would put my money on Anna Marie Horst to out sprint the two riders in this group. She uh, has a really good uh, kick on her. Does the rider on the back there in the red from triple seven just kicking the sand out of the shoes. Alvarado leading out. Castellan still trying to get that right foot in. Sometimes you might planks. find that sometimes you might find that the riders aren't bunny hopping as much because they might have sand in their shoes and they might find it that they're not entirely so safe that they're going to jump and their feet are still attached to the pedals. Horst just moves up past her teammate onto the wheel now of uh, Celine Alvarado, Inga van der Heiden out of that corner, dismounts 
for the run through the planks. Black back to our leading group. This is your podium. Salim Del Carmo de Alvarado from Coroner Circus. Anuari first and Yara Castelline. Castelline out of this group. The rider on the back, the European champion. Again, will need to uh, try and attack uh, to get away from that group. Azufi, Pizza, Kant, Lechner and Blanca Catavas are your next group on the circuit. This is and a good we... position for Celine to be in right now. I really feel that from this position she can she can win this race. Um, Amory Warst is probably the best sprinter in that group, but it, again, it, if you can't get in the front to lead, it's such a short sprint from that those steps to the finish line. But Warst is trying to come past her at that point. Can't quite get past. Ryder just gets, uh, pulls over to the side. You just saw out of that corner, Anna Relief Worst trying to get herself up towards the front. Celine Alvarado reacted, wants to keep the front. So we'll go through this long section. Remember, it's mud into the steps, and then everyone has to remount at the end of the at the top of the steps and get ready for the sprint up the hill to the finish. Castelline on the back here. They're just bending the tape, as Jeremy Powers would say, just uh, riding this course to its absolute limit. Alvarado on the front, really gassing it to try and force any mistakes from the riders behind. Worst though, seems to have the measure, just about to come up and lap another rider just ahead of them. Castelline has to dismount on that section. Worst doesn't, but Alvarado again opens up just a small gap on Anna Marie Worst. This is probably all she needs. She, uh, she only needs to make her be trying really hard, and then her sprint will be affected as well. And that's... If... So she's just trying to dent that sprint now of Anna Marie Hurst. Just take the edge off the power. Not far away now, this, lining it up. She could ride. They can't, neither of them can ride. If someone could have ridden that, that would have been it. Onto the steps for the run up. Yara Castline on the back. Alvarado's got the front. It's going to be all about the remount now. Getting those feet in and now lining it up for the finish. Alvarado kicks on at the front. Anna Marie Hurst tries to react. Will the uphill sprint suit her? It's shoulder to shoulder, but Anna Marie Hurst has the power in the sprint. Comes through, Hurst takes it from Alvarado. Alvarado did everything that she could there to try and out sprint the triple seven rider. Yara Castellan, another podium for the European champion. Great finish by her. And Inga van der Heiden is your next rider. Yeah, that was a fantastic sprint by Wars. She really is the best of those sprinters in that group right now. As we said, it came down to the remount and who could get those uh, feet in. And uh, Celine Alvarado is uh, putting a good sprint there. Didn't manage to uh, overcome anybody worse. Back to our next group. Puck Peterson, Alicia Maria Arzufi. Peterson gets her feet in here as Arzufi, again, tri triple seven into that uh, sprint now with uh, Peterson. This is another good finish from the young rider here, wearing 54, European junior champion. Fifth place for Peterson, just ahead of Arzufi. Another good finish here by the 18 year old from Hungary, Blanca Gattavas, and then uh, Asana Kant. Crosses the line here for eighth, just ahead of uh, Ava Lechner. Yeah, another brilliant ride by the young riders there. Um, particularly Puck Peters at 17 years of age to come in fifth in that result's really good. It's going to be a 10th place finish for Magali Rochette. So the Canadian champion high fives the crowd as she crosses the line. 10th place finish for the Canadian Ellen Van Loy, former winner. Comes in for 11, so a solid ride here for uh, Ellen Van Lowe. Looks like Mount Captain's coming in just ahead now of Evie Richards. So Evie Richards has to settle for uh, 13th, and then Katie Compton comes in at 14th. Compton, no luck at all in that race tonight. It's Annick Van Alpen. Oh, sorry, get your hook. So Van Alphen coming in next, and then, uh, oh, got a feel for this rider, Helen. Sharon Van Anroy, what a race that she put in, and uh, hopefully 
the sponsors can can find her another bike in the pit. Here comes Anna Kay. Uh, not the night for her either. That broken uh, broken chain and a bit of a run. 17th as riders just go down. Man on backup. Pauline Ferran Provo. This is a this is a really good. You got to say for Pauline Ferran Provo from uh, 109th on the on the start to uh, to the to this point in the race. Yeah, that's a really good. Oh, that's Man and Backer that crashed there, taking. Provo had to just go around her, that was all. Um, yeah, I, th I think it's a really good start to the season for sure. She's unfortunately not going to get a single UCI point from that performance. So, um, despite a good performance, uh, points only going to go down to 15th. So, um, she's going to have to use the next races. She, I think she goes to Switzerland in a couple of days and um, she has a good opportunity there for sure. Definitely, Manon Backer comes in 20th, just behind Clara Honsinger. And then your next rider to uh, finish, Madigan Munro. Here's Anna-Marie Poerst. Yeah, so I'm a few years ago. I'm happy with this overwinning. It was a very hard race. We were on each other waiting, but we didn't get away. And uh, yeah, I'm happy with this overwinning. How deep can you have to go? Eh? Het was uh, geen sprint van de laatste rechte lijn, maar een sprint van de laatste ronde. Het was gewoon eigenlijk vanaf de klim uh, ging jaren van de en ging sprinten. Toen ze er achteraan, toen na ging Celen nog een keertje. En uh, ik ben blij dat ze het eerste, na nou, de laatste sprint kon doen eigenlijk. En die kon winnen. Dacht je dat je op kop moest draaien in die laatste rechte lijn? Nou, ik wist niet. Nou, de kop of niet per se, maar wel dicht in het wiel, want het is niet heel lang meer. Het is eigenlijk, uh, het trap is even snel mogelijk in je pedalen geprobeerd te komen. Want er zit natuurlijk helemaal modder in je pedalen. En uh, dat is snel mogelijk naar de finish sprint, dat is niet heel ver. Hoe moeilijk is het om de perfectie uit te voeren aan hartslag 190, 195, ik weet het niet. Nou, wel lastig hoor, je moet laatst stukken. We gingen het al best wel vroeg aan en uh, je zit eigenlijk al het hele rondje een hele hoge hartslag. En dan je nog zo, ja, zo, zo snel mogelijk de modder heen en ook weer zo snel mogelijk weer uh, op de fiets komen. Dat is waar. Het doet ook wel deugd denk ik om de vrouw die door velen op dit moment beschreven wordt als de, de beste croster die, die de laatste weken aan het rondrijden is, al vooruit dat je ze ja, mano aan mano kan knoppen. Ja, zeker. Zeden is zo sterk en uh, ik blijf dat ik weer een keer van kan winnen. Absoluut, gefeliciteerd. So she said there that she was um, it was a really hard race. Oh. She said that it was a really hard race and that it was really difficult for um, anyone to get away because the race was so fast. Um, and then in the last lap, she wanted to try and get ahead. It was almost like they were sprinting from the sandpit down the whole time, but she couldn't get ahead. And then she knew that she ran faster up the outside. Then there was a potential that she could come past in the sprint. Celine's really, really strong. And um, they said the racing's really exciting at the minute for the women. Um, and she said, yeah, and it's, it's good to be at the front with fellow Dutch riders, basically. Looking at that sprint, though, I think from uh, going back to going back to my track days, I think Alvarado almost just she, she, she opened the, 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 the double doors wide there for Anna Marie Worst to uh, to allow her to come through. I think maybe a little bit of work with the with the elbows on the on the sprint there. If we if we can have a little look back at the sprint, I think, and just the way she sort of left the gap open for uh, Anna Marie Worst to come through almost. I don't think she shut the gap. I think that was more what it was. Um, you might see more in the men's racing that they'd go straight to the barrier and close her off. But um, I don't think you see that as much necessarily in women's racing. But like uh, Amory also said that um, her heart rate's really, really high. She was basically sprinting the last half a lap. And then she had to sprint up the stairs and then sprint again. And you're probably not thinking straight away, like this, Celine's not thinking, oh, I need to push her in the barrier. She's thinking to the line, straight to the line. So... Um, yeah, yeah, it, it was a fair sprint and Amory was stronger. It was a fair sprint. Let's have a look at the top 10 of uh, this evening's uh, race. Anna-Marie Huerst takes that ahead of Celine Del Carmen Alvarado, Yara Kasslein, Inge van der Heide and Puck Peters. Look at that, top five Dutch riders. The Italian Alicia Maria Zufi in sixth from Hungary, Blanca Katavas in seventh, Sana Kant from Belgium in eighth, Ava Lechner in ninth and Magali Rochette from uh, Canada rounds out the uh, top 10. For At the moment, the the Dutch, um, the new sort of sort of uh, group of Dutch riders, Helen, from right the way from Puck Peterson all, all the way through to Mariana Vos and, and Lucinda Brand. Uh, the competition for the world is is going to be is going to be phenomenal in every level, isn't it? It really is. And last <laughs> year we saw how the Dutch riders didn't really work together very well. 
But I think this year that you'll find with riders being on the same team, like uh, Yara Castellain and um, Amri Worst. Um, and I think Celine is in under the same banner. So the same management owns all those teams. And so I think you'll find they'll be, be working a lot better together this year. Um, and it will be a lot harder for Sana to win. Whereas last year, she profited from the fact that they were just watching each other, basically. Looking at today, we look at sort of talking points throughout that race. And we look particularly that that opening lap too many riders on the start list for a for a for an elite women's professional race perhaps would you say i would say that the world ranking does sort you out um for Provo to pick to come back to this race obviously she got paid a lot of start money um <laughs> Because you would normally approach the season with a lot more ranking points. And when you're in the first three rows of the grid, yeah, it's tough from third, fourth, fifth row. And obviously, <laughs> 11th row is really, really hard. But as through the season, you have your rolling world ranking. And those riders that are the best, get the most points, are at the front of the race in the majority. And so 110 is a lot. And it's really tough for the junior girls, for the young riders that are first year that don't have any UCI points. You saw um, Maddie Monroe there in around 17th or 18th place, and she would have come from pretty far back on the grid, to be fair, seventh or eighth row. So it is tough for, for new people coming into the sport, but hopefully next year with the Junior World Cup and with the um, more Helen 100 races, the junior girls will have an opportunity to get UCI points as well, um, and they'll be able to have their own races. And in a couple of years, it will spread out again. But equally, we've got 105 men, I think, in the, in the men's race later. So it's a lot. It doesn't happen very often. <laughs> While we've got you here, let's talk a little bit about the Helen 100 loan out. It was a it was a great race, and we we saw uh, Lizzie Gonzalez from the US taking that. And again, different nations. Zoe Backstead going from the the last rider on the on the grid to second place on the podium, and then uh, you know we, a good group of nations up there in in the top ten as well. You must be really proud of what you've managed to achieve with with developing this series. It's really, really exciting to see. It's, it's, it gives you goosebumps because I came from the, the sport when I first started in 1999. There wasn't even an, a World Cup for elite women. The first year of that was 2000. We didn't have a World Championships to 2000. And so in 19 years to then go to the point where I'm able to support four junior races um, for these riders is just absolutely brilliant. And the spirit on the finish line is just amazing and you you've probably seen photos like a uh, balance canvas and cycle photos put up a load of photos and that's that captures the whole atmosphere the girls are so excited to be able to do their own race and they were like 61 riders that's crazy and for them that's crazy as well but they're literally 15 to 18 year olds and there were 61 of them on the start line and it's it's really, really good. It's really, it shows that there's a need for it. It shows that there's been a need for it um, and build it and they will come. <laughs> Indeed. But also you've got to say that, that from a rider's perspective and seeing all those different nations that were in there, so much investments from the from their families and from their support teams and their national teams to, to have them, because a lot of them, they spent Christmas in their campers and, and, and accommodation. And, and that's something very, very special in terms of that, that backup that, that you need. A lot of these riders are there with their families. The Americans and Canadians came over with the national team. And that's really good that um, people are into supporting that. And I know Jesse Anthony, that's um, currently in charge of the American national team. He really wanted to bring over junior girls so that they could do that. And also Jeff Proctor, who used to do that has brought over uh, a load of junior girls as well. And if it wasn't for the Helen 100, you'd probably pick and choose who you brought over at this time of year. So for me, it's really important that the junior girls have an opportunity to show how good they are without a nation having to select them. As the same as elite riders do, the elite riders can go out, get the UCI points, prove how good they are, show their nation, okay, now you need to take me to Worlds. And these junior girls have had that opportunity too, which is really, really important. It is indeed. And they you're still doing do. a great There's job. There's still two you're... more rounds. Yeah, you're There's doing still a two phenomenal more job. Well done. <laughs> Don't forget, and we'll try and make sure that we uh, that we promote those. When's the next one? The next one is Baal, and then Brussels is the final round. And they've got equal prize money to the junior boys, and they've got an equal overall prize fund to the junior boys as well. <sighs> there you have it. And we're here for Baal <laughs> as well. Uh, let's have a look back at what was a phenomenal uh, elite women's race here in Degen.
past the line on the start line. This was really the shape of things to come off the line under the floodlights. It was Celine Alvarado that led out here. Yara Castellina alongside uh, her. Magali Rochette from Canada got a good start. So did Anna Kay. Alvarado is having a, a really, really strong week. And I think this uh, this point here, Helen, showed just how many riders were uh, were in this race. Yeah, and you can see the riders backing up, having to jump off their bikes at that point. And it, you can already see the separation and where Castellina here made a mistake. and took uh, Amory Warst out the back with her but on a course like this it's so easy to come back again and this was your leading group Shirin Van Anroy the young rider there from Team 185 did a great ride to get on to the back of the group Sana Kant and Inga van der Heiden just behind them over the top of the bridge this uh, trio of riders really were uh, looking at each other watching each other intently uh, and nobody worse we would know is that was the best sprinter out of uh, this group. Alvarado did exactly the right thing, leading from the front. Out, uh, and nobody worse came through. And uh, but this was the, the point steps. where this was the point where Wars just ran as fast as she could up those steps, got on almost immediately at the top, and so they both remounted exactly the same time. And at that point, she had the advantage to sprint. And she just felt, you could see there, Annemarie Hoerst just come alongside her. They've sprinted it out many times this season. And it's the 777 rider, though, that has got the measure in the sprint between the two of them. Alvarado did everything that she could in that sprint. Didn't have an answer for the power of Annemarie Hoerst. And uh, Yara Castellain, the European champion, uh, looking like she's coming back into some good form. Cross the line in third. There's your top ten. So Horst from Alvarado, Castelline, Van der Heiden, Pizza, Azufi, uh, Blanca Katavas, Sanakan, Ava Lechner and Magali Rochette was your top ten. What a great race. That's, uh, I enjoyed that one. Did you? <laughs> that was an exciting one for sure. It always is exciting here though because there is so much road. It's bunch racing. Um, and so for me, this is a good one to watch. It was indeed. Right, we've got a bit of halftime entertainment. The men's race is at 7 o'clock in the UK. That's 8 o'clock in uh, Europe. But Helen and I will be back just before that. Just for a bit of halftime entertainment, we're going to let you have the GCN show and also the GCN tandem race. We'll be back soon. Enjoy the break. From the back of the queue, reindeer, welcome to the GCN show. Welcome to the GCN show. Coming up this week, we are going to go through a list of the do's and don'ts for cyclists over the Christmas period. Things you absolutely must do and things you should most definitely avoid. Come on, mate, you've got to show your face. Can't stay down there forever. <laughs> uh, we've also got a very exciting announcement. We've got a brand new GCN presenter. Uh, not Cy, but find out who that is very soon indeed. There is, of course, a forfeit for the loser. They will be getting a full spray tan and having their nails done. Hey, come on there, come on there. Come on first. For the results. Oh, no. Come well on done on all making it. Sai <laughs> loses the challenge. <laughs> By just one minute. <laughs> I want a Mystic HD, but I'm not totally sure. Shut Not going to be on. <laughs> takes a bit of time for it to develop. So this uh, this is the tip of the iceberg, and actually, uh, it's just gonna get worse for the next eight hours. 
This week in the world of cycling, we learnt that Tom Pidcock has skills for days. Here he is becoming the first rider to actually ride this incredibly steep bank at the Dreven Cross on Saturday. Will Tom Pidcock manage to ride this section again? He does! And only having seen Pidcock ride it did Matthew Van Der Poel attempt it himself. The same in the sand. Van Der Poel takes the line that Pidcock does. No, not many people can get, so they've got one over Matthew Van Der Poel, have they? Uh, right, now we also learned this week the real price of the new Hope track bike that's being used by British Cycling. A cool £26,000. And unfortunately, you will still need a few of your own bits to complete the build, like pedals, saddle, cranks, chain. That's a lot bars. of money for a bike, isn't it? It Especially is. Especially yeah. one that resembles a Zimmer frame. Although we should stress that this is for the more expensive option of that bike. That is the Sprinter's one, which we figured we'd probably need. Yeah, exactly. Uh, now, as Dan mentioned at the beginning of the show, we have some very exciting news. We've got a new GCN presenter! We have indeed. We are very pleased to announce that fresh from the UCI Track World Cup circuit, Manon Lloyd will be joining us as of the 1st of January. Yes, now, we should stress that she is no relation to this particular Lloyd, although when you find out that she's won UCI Track World Cups in Madison and Team Pursuit, you probably make that assumption for yourself. There's not much genetic similarity. Thanks, there. Si. Uh, but not only has she been at the very highest level on the boards, she's also been a professional on the road as well. Yeah, and even dabbled in cyclocross. I'm sure she's going to be delighted we yeah. chose to use that photo for her intro. Yeah, it's better than this, anyway. Well, that's obvious. Yeah. Uh, anyway, it goes without saying, we are thrilled that Manon has chosen to join our team. Yeah, we absolutely are. Right then, the holiday season is upon us. I believe that's what Christmas is called anyway. And for many of us, it is a brilliant opportunity to get out and spend some time on the bike. For others, though, it is a time fraught with conflicts, mistraining and guilt. Yeah, a bit like your pro cycling career, isn't it? Yeah, thanks very much for that, Si. Anyway, to help you through this moral maze, we thought we'd bring you a list of do's and don'ts for cyclists over the Christmas period. Yeah, first up, don't put your bike away in the shed. Find some time to get out and ride it, because one of the undisputed best bits of the Christmas period is the quieter roads. It's a rare treat, isn't it, to get out there and have the world to yourself. Yeah. You don't want to take it too far, though, because what you don't want to be is that cyclist that prioritises the bike over everything else. Why are you looking like me when you say that? Anyway, you don't need to miss social gatherings now. Here's a quick pro tip. Why not take your indoor trainer to the gathering instead? That way, people can socialise around you, maybe even bring you food and drink, so you could potentially train even harder and longer than you otherwise would do. Okay. Plus, if you set it to erg mode, you don't even have to think about doing intervals, your trainer sets the resistance for you, so all you've got to do is pedal and then have a nice conversation while you do it. And you wondered why I was looking directly at you. Uh, now, if you do happen to be doing your training at your Christmas party, or just there in a normal capacity... I like to call it casual mode. You are such a weirdo. Uh, anyway, don't be that person that chooses to explain the importance of FTP to unsuspecting normal people. Yeah, do not be that guy. Instead, I've actually found considerable conversation mileage in the debate about one by versus two by. So maybe give that oh, yeah. one a try instead, yeah. And the other thing as well is if people give you a wide berth at parties, it's actually not the end of the world. You'll find that you're much less likely to get ill if no one wants to talk to you. I would actually agree with you on that yeah. one. Yeah, there's nothing worse than getting ill over the Christmas period. So whether you decide to ride your bike just to socialise or to do a combination of both, make sure you avoid people with coughs and colds at all costs because being ill at that period is going to suck. Yeah, not least because it's going to ruin your form for the Boxing Day race, isn't it? There's always a bike race near you on Boxing Day. Dan, you, I know, were very partial to a Boxing Day 10 mile yeah. time trial, weren't you? Yeah. You gonna do one this year? No. No. I, yeah, I might dabble in my first cyclocross oh, race, race of the season. Yeah, potentially. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Whilst we're thinking about cross, actually, something that, that any cross rider, probably any cyclist, should do over Christmas, very excitingly, clean the inside of your washing machine out. You'd be amazed at how much gunk collects in there. Nobody's yeah, gonna do that job over the Christmas period. Well, it and anyone who lives with you might be thankful if you do. Right. So, uh, yeah, and by the way, I once found a quid in there when I did it, so you might want to give okay, it a go. Well, we're moving quickly on from that one. Now, if you happen to get some nice, spangly new Lycra uh, cycling kit for Christmas, what you want to be really wary of is when you take it out on its first ride. Because the worst thing you can do is ride in very bad conditions and crash in it and rip it to shreds. Yeah, and it's so easily done, isn't it? So make sure you get at least one ride in it, take it steady 
and then uh, then you'd be all clear. Yeah. I, I'm ruining the day that I crashed first ride out on my Assos Windblock tights in 2007. I can't forget that. Well, you can't forget it because you're still riding them 12 years later with a hole in the knee. Well, that's true. I mean, you could avoid crashing at all by not riding your bike, of course, and instead choosing to watch other people ride theirs. For example, Wout van Aert is making his return to competition on the 27th of December, and you'll be able to watch that live on GCN Racing. That's interesting. His comeback's just one day after mine. It is, yeah. 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 And now, I'll tell you one thing even better than watching Wout van Aert make his comeback on GCN Racing, is going for a ride either before it or after it, depending on where you live in the world, because then you have to feel guilty about sitting on the sofa watching bike racing. Yeah, guilt's a big one, actually, isn't it? Oh, it is. In fact, for many cyclists, Christmas is a period of feeling guilt, isn't yep. it? Guilty for celebrating, yep. guilty for what they're eating, guilty for what they're drinking, or maybe guilty for not celebrating, or not drinking, or the aforementioned abandoning of loved ones. But don't feel guilt. Whatever you choose to do over this Christmas period, do it without feeling bad. Hey, absolutely, yeah, 100% serious about this one. If you do decide to overindulge a little over Christmas, then rest easy in the knowledge that it will not matter one jot how many helpings of Christmas pudding you have, come springtime. In fact, it won't even matter come January the 2nd, will no, it? No, probably won't. Although if you decide to go the other way and prioritise bike riding, don't worry about that either because yeah. your friends and your loved ones will, well, they might forgive you in time. Like, yeah. It's not quite as guaranteed as burning off the Christmas pudding. No, no, that is true. Uh, right, now make sure you let us know in the comments section if there are any Christmas pitfalls that you are going to be particularly wary of this year, either having made them before or witness someone else make them. I'm looking forward to reading those, Dan. Absolutely. On Christmas Day, perhaps. Uh, right then. Now, we have some very, very, very exciting news here at GCN. If you're on social media over the weekend, you might have seen a post about this already. But basically, we are getting together with our mates at GMBN to hold a proper bike festival. Four days of epic riding, road, mountain bike, gravel, plus loads of live events, parties, music and a whole load more. Yeah, that's going to be awesome, I yeah. think, isn't it? It's all going to take place over the weekend of the 18th to the 21st of June. And the venue is the beautiful Alpine Resort of Salbach in Austria, where actually we had a decent event uh, just back in August. Mm -hmm. Now, if you'd like to know more, you need to head over to globalbikefestival.com, where you'll be able to sign up for a newsletter, which will give you all the latest news, of course. Uh, but you also there be able to get access to the early bird prices. Yeah, awesome. Exciting stuff, isn't it? Right then, one person, Dan, who is going to have to watch what they eat and drink over Christmas, or they probably don't have to worry too much about getting ill, do they, is Ollie, because he's going to have to get everything he can to beat Eddie Merckx in his hour of power. Let's get an update. <laughs> All right, this week's been a rough week um, and not much activity as you may have seen if you follow me on Strava. Um, and that's because I managed to get a nasty stomach bug like some gastroenteritis and um, it completely wiped me out. Like, I've just been physically unable to do anything, let alone training. Um, and it's just been massively frustrating. You know, when you, your motivation to train is high and also this is quite a pressing challenge, you don't feel like there's any time to waste. It's, uh, it's been pretty pretty tough going. But something that has helped is the Sufferfest, which is quite unique, has a mental training aspect. Um, and so that's been pretty good at sort of keeping me positive. I mean, one, one silver lining to this massive toilet-shaped cloud is the fact that I've managed to lose three kilos. <laughs> not ideal but you know there we go anyway hopefully I can get back on training soon and, uh, and get back to, to back, back on track uh, I'll see you next time hopefully with more positive news it is now time for your weekly GCN inspiration. This is where you submit your inspirational cycling photos and videos we pick our favourite three and they will win one of three prizes which this week are £10 for third £40 a second and £100 to spend on whatever you want on the GCN online store if you are the big winner. Now, I noticed you didn't get around to fixing this one. That no, and I probably won't now. if I'm completely honest. Si. Uh, right then, in third place this week is Breezy Badger. Uh, on my commute home I was stopped by this amazing sunset. Again, it's in the Wiener Wald si. Oh, Sausage World. Brilliant. Uh, no, uh, Vienna Forest, isn't it? Wiener Wald. Um, that is an absolute stunner of a photo. It's a competitive week this week, isn't it, mm. Dan? This 
a worthy winner of a £10 voucher, but wowzers. That's a that's a pearl of a shot. Uh, right, in second place, we've got this one uh, from Mike Addington. Uh, what was supposed to be a relatively easy ride turned into a monster climb of 7,000 feet. A must do for anyone on Gran Canaria. Yeah, that does sound like Gran Canaria, doesn't it? Mm. And look at that photo. Woo! It's been a few years. When did we go there? 2018, wasn't it? Oh, not as long ago as so I think. <laughs> I miss it. I love my memory's fading fast. But yeah, that's a lovely photo and a lovely place to ride your Absolutely. bike. Absolutely. Look at that. Oh, look at that blue sky and warm weather. Anyway, right. £40, 40 pounds. Pounds for you, Mike. Uh, but with the big £100 prize in first place this week is Calatorlan. Yeah, if I pronounced it correctly, wouldn't it? Uh, anyway, just before 8 a.m., heading for work, I'm lucky to get this view on my way in, just outside of Stockholm in Sweden. We weren't sure whether to believe there was a sunrise yeah, at that time in the morning. We, we just this checked it on Google. Yeah, shot one. Yeah, <laughs> uh, but apparently there is. Yeah, so 845. We, the we sunrise. are awarding you the 100 pounds, uh, and well deserved, I think you'll say, because that is yet another stunning photo. Isn't it just? And what a cool ride to work as well. Absolutely brilliant. Yeah. That's a brilliant. Does by do I match the? Um, Hundred pound? Uh, no, you're way more orange oh. than that orange one hundred pound gift voucher. Great. All uh, right, before we move on, a reminder of how to submit your inspirational cycling photos and videos. Uh, two ways to do so: the uploader, link to which is in the description below, or you can use the app. Now, speaking of the app, all the inspirational photos from this week's show, and indeed the hacks and bodges that we're going to come on to a little bit later, are in one handy segment of the app. So scroll across the top part to the right until you get to shows, click on this week's show, and it'll all be in there for you to vote on. Happy days. Right then, time for a little update on Dan's adventure, the quest to ride 1,474 kilometres uh, in the month before Christmas, uh, owing to the very rash post that you put up on the app uh, saying you'd ride a kilometre for every like. It was a well-liked post. Anyway, where are you at, at the moment, mate? Nearly there? I'm at about 1,418, I think. I worked out, I've got 56 to go. Yeah, well, seeing as today uh, is almost the shortest day uh, of the year, we thought it was the appropriate time to do the longest commute. Uh, so, hopefully by the time you watch this, Dan will have ticked over all the kilometres because we would have ridden all the way home, all 68 kilometres yeah. of it. Fingers crossed. Yeah, uh, but if you don't see anything uh, like a video now, we, it's raining and we haven't done it. Looks like we're doing it, Si. Yeah, it does, doesn't it? I don't know why I've got sunglasses on, but still, it's pitch black out there. But not raining. <laughs> no, it's a little bit chilly, but we can do this, mate. Yeah, you're 68, flying at the minute. 68, well, you don't know yet. 68 kilometres. Yeah. Big hill to start. Right, let's go. Where are we, Si? Don't know, mate. No, I've got no idea either. Tell you what, though, it looks pretty arty right now. This isn't actually sepia, this is just dark, <laughs> isn't it? Yeah, and you're no longer orange, amazingly. <laughs> uh, no, we were reckoning we're about a third of the way through the ride, uh, so we're checking back in review, but we'll check back out again now and back in another third of the way. We've been fast three pubs, I think, so far, and size not let me go in any. No, but we that. might go into one at the end. Not only that, we've been flying, haven't we, mate? I think so. Yeah. Feels like it. Yeah, good old dark. Oh, I see. Yeah. Well, the bell's going. Uh, I've got 2.4 k's to go now until I've completed uh, my challenge. It's not far, is it? How does it feel, Dan? Uh, it feels good. It feels like I deserve a pint or two with you. I think you, des I think you do deserve a pint or two, mate. Yeah. yeah. It's been a good ride, though, hasn't oh, it? We've been awesome. licking along at a good pace. My battery light's almost run out. Um, it's been on full power the whole way, but so have I. I've just outlasted my lights. <laughs> we made the pub. We did. We've got a pint each. Cheers, mate. Cheers. Congratulations, uh, Dan. Thank you. Uh, so we did 68 k's, and that takes me over my kilometres for likes. So job done. Uh, one more ride tomorrow morning with a load of kids, including size, hopefully. He turns yeah. up at Moores Valley. Uh, but it's been a great adventure, really. It has. And almost 10 grand raised for World Bicycle. <laughs> Thank you very much, everyone, for your support. Well done, Dan. I think you deserve a round of applause, that mate. Oh, cheers. It's now time for cycling shorts. Cycling shorts now, and we're going to start with some more news from Zwift, because after last week's announcement of the winner of the Women's Zwift Academy, this week we had the announcement of the winner of the Men's Academy. Out of 60,000 entrants, New Zealand's Drew Christiansen has emerged as the winner of a professional contract with the feeder team of NTT, formerly Dimension Data. That's a lot of entrants. Isn't it just? Isn't it? Imagine being able to win something fair and square 
out of 60,000 people. Well, I can't really, but he must be quite a talent. He must be. Drew. Well, look forward to young Drew, he's only 18. I look forward to seeing how he gets on. Mm. All right, we're going to stick with indoor training for a little bit longer. There was an exciting announcement last week from RGT Cycling. Now, this is a virtual online cycling platform that for a long time has been in beta mode, but has now officially launched. And it's going to be free for users to use. As you can do any of the eight courses whenever you want, as much as you want, and you're also going to have the ability to join group rides and races. That's right. There is also a premium subscription tier as well, where, among many other things, you get access to a whole archive of structured training sessions, perhaps that you could do at a Christmas party, uh, or, um, or not or, and rather, you also have the option of creating so-called magic roads, so like a virtual road of any GPX file from real life that you send into them. How We're cool gonna have a, it's very cool. We're going to have a closer look at RGT cycling over on GCN Tech in the new year. That's a lot of talk about indoor cycling, but what we shouldn't forget are those winter warriors who are still outside riding on the road. Yeah, Canadians. Yeah, exactly. Uh, this piece of news over on CBC caught our attention. So certain districts of Montreal are trialling a new technique for clearing snow from bike paths, which is going to make it even easier for Canadians to keep riding their bikes at minus 20 or below. Yeah, as if they need any help. <laughs> you guys have got it dialed already. Apparently, Dan, the secret source to this new method uh, is it's actually a sweeper combined with a brine solution that's mm. then on, on the tarmac. Uh, and uh, according to the local councillor, Marianne Giguer, it's totally worth it. She said, if you plough it, they will come. Mm. Yeah. Anyway, we are going to look forward to warmer climbs now because last week at their team launch, Jumbo Visma announced their intentions for the 2020 season and it would appear their intention is to win the Tour de France. Yeah, now you might be asking, well, what gives you that impression, guys? Uh, and uh, well, it's this basically their star rider for the Giro d'Italia, Dylan Groenewegen, mm. their star rider for the Vuelta, Stephen Kreisweich. And then for the Tour de France, Dan? Primoz Roglic, Tom de Moulin and Stephen Kreisweich. Oh, wow. uh, then they've got Tony Martin, who's got Ooh. a bit of an engine. Yeah. Wout van Aert, he's all right. As yeah, well, not bad. They? And then on the climbs, Sepp Kuss, Robert Hessing and Lawrence de Plus. Wowzers. They are putting all their eggs in one basket there, aren't they? But why not? Hmm. I mean, we've seen, haven't we? The old one, <laughs> two, three really does work in cycling, doesn't it? Well, it doesn't really, Si, does it? It doesn't work for Mobistar for many years, does it? The one, no. two. That works. Yeah. Doesn't it? We saw that with Wiggins and Froome many yeah, years did, ago. Yeah. We saw that with Froome and Geraint Thomas, both on the podium yeah. last year. This year, the one two with Geraint Thomas and Egan Bernard, and yeah. the one two of us with Jens Fox. My goodness. Yeah. Equal team leaders going into that. You were yeah. slightly stronger on the day, so it worked for you. But uh, yeah. It was touch and go, wasn't it, whether he was going to be able to bring you back. But then when he did, whoof! Yeah. Oh, wow. I cracked him. Yeah. yeah. yeah well, anyway, good luck to Jumbo Visma in 2020. Absolutely. Yeah, you can definitely say, can't you? It's cracking to have another team with unarguably the same amount of firepower as Team Ineos. In all seriousness, I cannot wait for next year's Tour de France if they manage to get those eight riders to the start of the race yeah. in top form. It's going to be brilliant. Everybody, happy holidays. Here in Massachusetts, the sun is shining. There is a little bit of snow on the ground, so we might get a white Christmas. If you didn't know, GCN Racing has so much great coverage coming up all through the Christmas period, also known as the cursed period. There's gonna be a ton of racing on GCN, the World Cups, Super Prestige, DVV Trophy, Effius Cross. It is gonna be going down, so check in with Marty and I. Also, if you guys haven't yet checked out season one of the podcast, we just wrapped it up. I think we have eight episodes in the can with all of the top riders from the world. E.B. Richards, Toon Ertz, Quinton Edermans, Lars Vanderhaar, Katarina Nash, Katie Compton. Some really great, fun stories, so I hope you guys will check them out. See you over on the Racing Channel. Check it out, GCN Racing, and talk to you soon. Right, we've got some uh, some winners for you now from our amazing no pins giveaway uh, that we ran a couple of weeks ago now, actually, haven't we? So yeah, four lucky winners of an amazing bundle from the people at no pins. Uh, skin suit, race suit, some mega aero socks, and some mega aero overshoes too. I might do the boxing day 10 if I'm one of the winners. I'm yeah, you, you might go fast, actually, if you wore that stuff. <laughs> uh, right, the winners are, drum roll please. We'll do all right in case you don't put the sound effects on afterwards. Uh, Simon Goosens from Belgium. Well done, Simon. Oh, it might be Goosens. Anyway, Edgar Barrian from the US, Paul Lee from the US, and Matt Donovan from here in Great Britain. There you go, congratulations. Yeah, that is a cool prize, isn't it? Uh, just to make you aware, might be a slight delay in contacting the winners on this occasion because of our Christmas holiday, where we will be socialising, so won't we, rather than riding our bikes. Yeah, I, yeah, no, I might, um, yeah. might socialise. Hack. 
forward slash bodge of the week. I call you out then, didn't you I? You did, yeah. Uh, before we get on to this week's hacks and bodges, uh, apparently, side si, begging works. Uh, it because does. in last week's hacks and bodges section, we've been sent these amazing key rings by Stephen of Orange. Thank you so Clark. much, Stephen. Those are so cool, aren't they? They are brilliant. No instructions as to how to make them yourself. No. no. So we can't nick his idea. No, but well done. They are super cool. So yeah. yeah. yeah we really like them, don't we? Thank you very much indeed. Uh, anyone else that wants to send us anything, we will gladly accept <laughs> right <laughs> next up. We have this from Jingle Down. In fact, not next up, this is the first one. Uh, we wanted somewhere to hang the breakable baubles where the kids couldn't reach them. We have nowhere suitable in our house, so I hung a spare wheel from the ceiling and hooked the baubles on. Wow. That's not very festive, is it, if I'm completely honest? Can I say bodge? I don't want to seem like Scrooge straight off the bat there, but... It was slightly weird that you said wow to start with and then changed your mind. Wow. <laughs> what? Does that mean I've got to give him a hack now? That's no, my first no, thought. No. Was... Uh, uh, sorry about that, uh, Jingle Just, Dow. Yeah. That is a bodge. Massive bodge. Dude. Right. <laughs> Unlike this one, what a centerpiece to go on your uh, your beautiful Christmas table. Uh, this was sent in by Kenyon Curtis. I made a Christmas tree. I have old cassettes, spokes, and a free wheel and a chain. Look at that base made out of wood. Yeah, I think that one uh, by Curtis has been helped by the fact that it's on a, a Christmassy looking table. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. No, it probably doesn't look like a Christmas tree, does it? They look like they might need a bit of degreasing, some of those sprockets as well. <laughs> so, uh, I don't know. I'm still going hack for that one. Yeah, me too, actually. Hack. Yeah, well done. Uh, we also had this on the app from Alpen John. How to fetch a Christmas tree fast. Stick the stem of the tree into that bottom loop on a back tramper backpack and use a cord to tie the upper part to the backpack. Boom! Top speed, 55 k's an hour. No Whoa. worries, mate. Well, rather you than me, Alpen John, uh, but... Uh, it's a mighty Christmas tree and he looks quite comfortable, so yeah, fair play, should we say hack? I think we'll say hack because you love Christmas trees transported on bikes. Do, yeah, we've got one more as well this week. Uh, but before we get there, we've got this one from Bordy, which is um, like a kind of angle poise. I don't, I'm not a massive fan of that. Are you not? Well, no. he's made it Christmassy by putting that little tree next to it. But what? Uh, I quite like that design. That's a festive bodge, putting a Christmas tree in and saying yeah. it's a Christmas tree. <laughs> An old DT Swiss wheel cheese board and IKEA lampshade turned into a reading lamp. I'd say hack, personally. You yeah. go bodge. Well, right, it's bodge. Uh, right, next up from the GCN app, this from alanbike.ro. How to transport a Christmas tree on a thu... I never know how you say that. Thu... thu... bike. Thu... 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 Yeah. yeah. Anyway, there we go. I like that one. I think that's great. Um, look at that. You just like loop the little uh, straps around the Christmas tree and away you go. Well, it's much better than getting all your needles in your car, isn't it? Yeah, it probably would come off the rack at 54k an hour, though, unlike Alp and John. Well, no, you still... need to tie it on. Right, maybe it'll work then. Yeah. All right, let us know how you got on. Hack. Presumably, actually, you got on all right because you sent us a photo. Otherwise, it just been an embarrassing broken Christmas tree at the side of the road. But anyway, there we go. Right, what's next? Uh, this from Bryce uh, had a bit of extra steerage tube after slowly lowering the stem, but still wanted my TT bars at a bit higher and closer. So I threw on an extra stem and used an old seat post to clamp on the bars. Well, why not? Oh Look at that. <laughs> Please tell me that's confined to the indoor trainer, because that looks like an accident way about way to happen, doesn't it? Yeah, bodge. Massive bodge. That's a huge bodge. Huge My goodness. bodge. Yeah, no, don't do not do that. Uh, right then, this one uh, from Edge Rattray. Uh, I took my bike on my festive travels, but forgot my bike light charger. This has blown my mind, Dan. So he made one, okay? He said he inserted an aircraft connector contact with some heat shrink, this is all meaningless words to me, and a spare wire, I don't know what that means, uh, to create a circuit, then hooked it up to a 5.1 volt power supply. My oh, word. That is next level hacking, <laughs> isn't it? I don't know what to say, but well, it's definitely a hack. It's completely over my head. 100% hack. That me. worked, yeah. that's a hack. Uh, next up, this from Adams on Kyle. Uh, or Adams and Kyle. I definitely need the additional travel for the hilly rides in downtown Chicago. Check it out. Full suspension trike. I mean, it's a huge bodge, isn't it? There's a lot going on in that photo. I quite like the look of that, dude. Mm, do you? Yeah, I mean, it is a bit bodged, but I quite well, like I it. I like it. We make one. I'll stand on the back, holding those little bars behind the saddle, and you can pedal along. <laughs> right. I, I wouldn't know where to start, mate. I really wouldn't. But the guy that can make charges from scratch, he could probably do one, couldn't mm. he? Yeah. Weird that it's easier to buy the bits to make a charger than it is to go and find a replacement charger. What are you talking about then? Well, I mean, I can't get my head around it. Anyway, uh, right, that is all uh, for this week. Um, as ever, please keep them coming in, either on the uploader or, of course, the GCN app. 
caption competition time now, which is your weekly chance to win a GSIN Elite water bottle. Uh, we provide you with a photo, you leave us your witty captions in the comment section down below, and we pick a winner. Last week's photo was this one of Yolin Vashkuren, uh, kind of doing cyclocross, and uh, we got a brilliant caption in. We have indeed. Sorry, just the photo itself makes me giggle. Uh, right, this was sent in by Max Power Simon. Great name there. Uh, he says, caption. Never stand when you can sit, never sit when you can lie down, never ride when you can slide. Genius. Yeah, you got a good point there as well. I very much like that one. Max, get in touch with us on Facebook with your address and we'll get this sent out to you. Uh, this week's photo is of the podium of the Men's Elite Cyclocross uh, from the World Cup in Namur on Sunday, which is very cold. Sai's going to get you started. Matthew van der Poel clearly delighted at taking his 57th victory of the season. Ah uh, yes, leave your best caption in the comments section down below and we'll pick a winner in two weeks time in 2020. Yeah, it's good mate, it's fine, it's fine. Thanks, I'll take that. We'll shortly be letting you know what's on the channel between Christmas and New Year basically, but first we're going to go through our favourite comments from last week. Uh, starting from underneath last week's GCN show where Stylish Riding wrote in and said Who's the dwee wearing gold shoes with his helmet on the back of his neck? Uh, well, stylish rider, I'm not sure if you were joking or not, but that was me. Deliberately looking unstylish, I might add. Dweeb does kind of sum it up, doesn't it? But there we go. Look at your face! <laughs> Yeah. Not my fault. <laughs> I didn't choose to have a Me. gold face. You chose to have gold shoes. You lost the race. I didn't. There's quite a lot of people suggesting that I apply for a steward's inquiry because Chris blatantly changed his back wheel as opposed to his front. Yeah. So anyway, yeah. the comments aren't all about me, Sai. Also in from Callum Spencer underneath the same show. It's good that the stool's the right size, said Simon, yeah, was, looking yeah. at a picture of a stool with a lump of timber stuck on top to bring it to the correct level. <laughs> yeah, no, I'm not quite sure how I missed that. But, um, it, I mean, it looked relatively pleasing to the eye, didn't it? Anyway, uh, right then, underneath uh, the video where um, I went to uh, meet Neil and Mac from the Suffest at their high performance centre over in Boulder, Colorado, uh, Fraser Goodwin uh, said, uh, ah, so Neil was a pro triathlete. Now we know why his top was on inside out last week. He just got a little twisted in transition and messed up his T-shirt as he pulled it on. But consummate pro, he carried on through the events to finish regardless. Yeah, no word on whether he was wearing socks actually that day. We uh, we couldn't see that, could we, on the um, <laughs> no on the Strava thing? But uh, the Strava apparently thing? it was something to do with a Back to the Future reference. That whole inside out. Yeah, it makes sense, doesn't it? Yeah. Well, I don't know. Uh, anyway, underneath the gravel upgrades video. Now, after suggesting that gravel uh, road, gravel bikes, I say, are like retro mountain bikes, it does seem now that history really is repeating itself, it does, like, doesn't yeah. it? Because we had this from Mr. Room, who's saying, adding an elastomer stem to the bike, it reduced shoulder and neck pain from washboarded gravel roads. Scott Phillips put, I fitted a red shift stem to my gravel bike, adds a little weight, but it deadens the high speed buzz you get on fire roads and reduces fatigue. And Paul Hewitt said, my upgrade is a suspension stem. Now, as any long time cyclist will know, Back in the day, late 80s, early 90s, Gervin had a flex they stem, did. which was uh, notoriously crap, wasn't it? Anyway, on the channel over the next week, on Wednesday, we're going to show you how to get rid of those annoying wheel suckers. Uh, that one comes to you from Hank. Uh, on Thursday, we've got cycling rules that are worth breaking. And on Friday, uh, we're going to let you know how to ride in the mud. Yeah, that's a cool one, that one. Uh, Jeremy Powers and cyclocross legend Tim Johnson uh, take you around the US Nationals course, which was very muddy, mm. wasn't it, and very technical. Uh, right, on Saturday, this is a cool one. So Jeremy got to go head to head, Tony Kinane, to see just how fit IndyCar drivers are. He is quite a fit one, isn't he? Is He's it? very fit, I've seen the video. Yeah, uh, but anyway, check that one out. Uh, and then on Sunday, we've got weird things that all cyclists do. Mm -hmm. I don't think turbo training at a Christmas party is in that one, which is weird. No, probably isn't, Si. Uh, Monday it's the racing news show. Speaking of which, over on GCN Racing, we've got a load of live cyclocross for you over the next week or two. I think there's five races by January the 1st, so make sure you check them out if you've got some time and you want to watch other people riding their bikes as opposed to doing it yourself. Or ride your bike in the morning and then watch, obviously. We're getting on for the end of the show now, but there is still time for Extreme Corner. Although this week it's not it's not extreme in the kind of Fabio Vibma sense, is it? It's extreme in the sense that it's extremely cool. Anyway, Hank and Mark Beaumont have been over in Patagonia bike packing, which I'm quite jealous about. Anyway, there is a video coming to you in the new year, but here is a little sneaky peek.
that is going to be a very cool video. Although I'm a bit worried for Extreme Corner because you said it's not extreme, but it's extremely cool. I mean, you should have something that's extremely tough, extremely hard. Not really Extreme Corner, is it? No, okay. It's just, um, well, just thought you might like it, mm. basically. Uh, right, well, that's pretty much all. Christmas GCN yeah. show, which we made a massive effort for, as you can see. Uh, but we would like to say a very happy Christmas to you all and a happy new year as well. There's going to be some after effects, aren't there? Making it a little Yeah, there's some snow coming down yeah. now, probably. It'll be great, yeah. Uh, anyway, please give the show a big thumbs up if you have enjoyed it. Yeah. And if you would like to watch uh, another video, then do make sure you check out GCN's Presenter World Championships to find out which channel reigns supreme in a tandem race. Am I worried about my opponents? No. I'm worried for my opponents. My shape uh, is uh, not the best shape of my life. Mamma mia! Chris, drop the face off! Oh, Chris! Now! My face is right in your bum. And it's not nice. The trouble with employing ex-professional cyclists is that they're a competitive bunch. A lifetime of racing, elbows out, fighting for every inch of road is, it would seem, a habit that is hard to break. And so it is that even within the harmonious Team GCN, there remains a fierce rivalry. Just who is the best? Well, viewer, by the end of this very special GCM video documenting the race to end all races, you will know once and for all. We have found ourselves in beautiful Mallorca, an absolute mecca for all cyclists. And I think the perfect test would be a lap of the island, 300 kilometers long. Yeah, what do you reckon? I think you're right. It probably would be the ultimate test, but it's after two o'clock and I do not fancy riding one of these for 312 kilometers. Okay. Instead, something shorter and more intense. So I think we should race to the lighthouse at Fort Mentor. It's one of the most iconic rides on the island. And I think we should take these boys on. Okay, us for GCN. And then representing on Espanol, we've got Sebastian and Oscar. And over on that side, we've got Anan from GCN Italia and Doi from GCN Japan making up what, Jitiban? Jitiban? Jitiban. The rules of this race are simple. This is a time trial exhibition. Each team will set off from the viewpoint of S. Colomer, two minutes apart from each other for safety reasons, and they will ride as fast as they can to the famous lighthouse at Cap Formentor. Fastest team will be crowned the winners. At just 13.85 kilometers, this route should be a mere sprint for our ex-professional cyclists, but with 413 meters of elevation and some dangerous twists and turns on the starting descent, will it be quite that simple? There'll be no official prize for the potential winners, only pride and honor to their respective countries. Let's see how the riders are feeling the night before the big race. So, big challenge tomorrow. Jimbo and I, thank you boy. <laughs> on the tandems. Okay. I I think we feel like we've got this. We're gonna win this, literally. Yeah. The only thing that worries me a little bit is look at the state of these hey, two. They look like all look the way to is ride their bikes. Climbing goats. I think we're gonna have to cause some sort of crash. Something Hank's very good at, so we'll um get that in early on. Yeah. Hope some goats are crossing the road on the way. I mean to... if we can't win, we might as well just take them out. <laughs> that was always Hank Jesus, so if you can't win, just take them out. Yeah. Uh, but in all seriousness, I'm on the front. No, you're not. We'll, 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 we'll uh, rock, paper, scissors it. The only life? place you get to on the you front is on the motorbike. Yeah. And that's because I don't yeah. have a license. We have just taken delivery of our race machine, our pride and joy. This is our tandem, complete with beautifully comfortable saddles, which, to be honest, I'm really pleased about. A back brake for whoever is brave enough to sit on the back, and mud guards to keep us clean when it rains. Yeah, we've made a few adaptations to the bike already. You'll notice we've got our road pedals on there. Other than that, we've got two calipers at the back for extra braking. Again, one actuated by the rear lever. We've also got a rack so we can carry 
I don't know what we can carry in there, really. That'll be good fun to work out later. We've got upswept bars, Shimano Tawny seven-speed drivetrain, and it's green. How much does it weigh? It, it weighs about the same as three or four normal bikes, I'd say. Oh, absolutely, absolutely perfect. Right, real question, mate. I'll steer the ship. I... I'll steer us to victory, mate. Don't think so. I've seen the scars on your legs. I think I'll drive. Really? Really. Rock, paper, scissors? No. Seriously? Right, we'll have this discussion later. Pair number two now, perhaps the greatest Italy-Japan cycling collaboration since Nippo Vini Fantini. But how do they fancy their chances? I feel uh, bad also because uh, my shape uh, is uh, not the best shape of my life for sure. Doi uh, never train. <laughs> he never train. I, I am afraid that uh, I have to, to push uh, a lot. And the roll. Alan at the helm, Doi in the engine room. What could possibly go wrong? Big gear, big gear, big gear. Pronto, pronto. Whoa! 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 It seems to be quite the baptism of fire here, tentatively negotiating these turns on the descent right after the start. Get the arrow, arrow, arrow. Arrow. Get the arrow. Left, OK. Perfect. I just put in the big gear. <laughs> Mamma mia! Now it's our third pairing, our Spanish-speaking duo of Sebastian and Oscar, looking lean, Focused, composed. Of course, looks can be deceiving. Too worried about Alan and Doy, because to be fair, Doy looked like he's going on holiday. He had his little camera in his hand, sunglasses on. Yeah. I'm a little bit nervous about Seb and Oscar because start look at the look They at look those unreal, guys. don't they? They, they look, look like, like whippets. Pros. They and look like racing whippets. Pros. And what do we look like? Two look English really... men on a beach with a fish and chips. We look like we've eaten well. Yeah. Three, two, one, go! Actually broken it. Uh, we've, bro <laughs> we've broken the bike. <laughs> Three, two, one, go! Because it's like it's like cool running, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. Oh, she's making some weird noises. Hard oh, the brake. Hard oh, the brake. Hard the brake. Hard the brake. Drop the gear. Drop the gear. Turn the cranks. Turn the cranks. Turn. Whoa. Up again. Up, 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 up. I do not like that noise. Left foot down! Wait on tire, pedal, pedal, pedal! Sounds like we've got an engine. My face is right in your bum. And right. it's not nice. On the brakes, on the brakes. Whoa, hard on the brakes. I'm terrified! How am I scared? I've got Opie on the front, he's got no fear! And now on the brakes, hard on the brakes. Right, let go, let go, let go. Right, got a left hander coming up. I've overshot this one many a time in the past. Oh. Let go of the brakes, let go of the brakes! Get wide, get wide. Oh, that's a car oh. bike. The drone is making it sound like we're going slower. I'll oh, change gear. Bit. Oh, <laughs> Man. Quick, quick, quick. Oh, no.
Cioè, non ci credo, cioè, oltre ad avere la bici sgonfia, c'è andato anche la bici con il cambio che non funziona, che adesso ha caduto anche la catena. Si è incastrata tra il pignone e il telaio e non viene più via. Guarda, non, 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 non lo sblocchi più. Cioè, io, dammi una mano, Yuki! Cosa stai fingendo? Non ho parole. Cioè, oltre ad avere la bici più sgonfia, anche quella col cambio che non funziona, cioè... Mm. Ma perché? Giorgio! Vota, vota! Grazie, io più The bike feels a little strange, soft maybe, when we're standing in the pedals, but I think we, we're doing okay, huh? Uh, for, for me, it's like the bike is not straight, like it's on the right side. And, uh, but I don't know if it's the bike or it's you, Sebas, yeah, that, maybe. You, that you're not straight. So many years in professional, I think I, a little bit to the side. <laughs> It was all going so well for Oscar and Sebas, but alas, once again, the machines have let them down. Who knows where neutral service has got to? But wait a second, I think they've sorted it. Back on the road. They've been watching some maintenance videos from somewhere. Yes! To me, to you, to me, to you. On we go. Grubby hands and all. No, pop, 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 pop. Oh, it's more downhill. Yeah. Please, so far. Please, so far. You're bummer, right? The saddle alright for you. Yeah. The saddle's big enough, yeah. Good. Ah! Ah! That's Venga. the spirit of it. He got got bitten, bitten by a mosquito. What? Because we're getting so slow. I'm trusting you here, Chris. I can't see anything. I can see the light at the end of the tunnel. Hey, light at the end of the tunnel? With the descent and a short flat section, our pairs are on to the stunning climb to Cap Foreman Tour. This is where they'll need all four legs working in synergy as they tackle the gradient. We're not done descending just yet. I'm getting towards the, the edge of my physical ability, man. I cannot talk so much. No, 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 as soon as possible. We need a stiffer tandem. It's too soft. F that, I'm gonna die. Chris, it's only a race. Broken my hip now. Chris, drop the bike off, oh, Chris! Get out! That was so much harder than I thought, like. 15 kilometers, it's not that far, but it's actually quite a long way to ride absolutely flat out. But I felt like we communicated really well together. It's not yeah. a handshake. Yeah, buddy. That was so much fun. <laughs> it was hard, but it was so much fun. It's cool to work as a team. I just hope we won. That's all I want to know. And the results are in. Alan and Doi, or should I say Japalia, come in third place with a time of 34 minutes and 15 seconds. 
Chris and James with a time of 32 minutes and 26 seconds and the winning time of 31 minutes and 55 seconds, the GCN and Espanol duo come in first. Oscar, congratulations. Thank you, mate. <laughs> Great job. Good. Yeah, well Good done. Well 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 done, Chico. Complimenti, Seba. Complimenti. 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 Malanga. Malanga. Chitty fan. Malanga. Yeah, if you guys enjoyed the video as much as we did make it, then make sure you give this video a big like. And if there's other GCM presenter challenges that you think we should give a go, then let us know in the comments section below. <laughs> Welcome back. If you want to know what it's like to work here at GCN, yep, it's pretty bonkers looking at uh, all those guys. I've uh, been uh, watching the forum. I thought we'd... Uh, I know it's a bit Blue Peter, but I know this comes up quite a lot. So, yes, Matthew Vanderpool is riding uh, tonight. So not far away. Okay. 10 minutes or so, just under 10 minutes away from the elite men's race. If you don't want to know what happened in the elite women's race, here's a five-second warning for you. Three, two, one. You can look away now. And it came down to that battle in the end between Anna Marie Hurst and Celine Del Carmen Alvarado out of that corner, up the steps. And then it was that race to the line. Alvarado not managing to out sprint Anamani Hurst. And the triple seven rider comes through to take the victory. Alvarado, the leader of the Super Prestige Series. Overall, Yara Castelline comes across the line to take third place. It really was a great race under the floodlights here in Deegan. There is your podium, so, triple seven, two riders with Castelline and Worst with Celine Del Carmen Alvarado on there in second place. There is your top 10. So Worst, Alvarado, Castelline, Van der Heinden, Puck Peters, and then the Italian, Al Zufi from Hungary. Blanca Catavas, Salakan, Ava Lechner, and great to see a Magali Rochette up there in 10th place, complete with Christmas lights. Helen Wyman is uh, back with me. Helen, it was, uh, it was a really, really exciting uh, women's race. Alvarado, pretty much everything that she could to try and uh, get clear of Anna Marie Hurst, because looking at form so far this season, as we said in commentary, Hurst seems to have the measure of most people when it comes uh, to a sprint. Yeah, Celine did everything that she could to get away. She also played the smartest move. She was first into every section in that last quarter of a lap and still Amory Worst was able to come around her. So there's nothing more you can do at that point. You just have to say, okay, I wasn't good enough on the day. Okay, let's have a look back at the Super Prestige series so far. If this is the first time you're joining us, this is what happened so far.
What a great series it has been so far. Wins for Elisabeth Tonarts and Matthew Van der Poel. And that means that Tonarts sits at the top of the leaderboard in the Telenet Super Prestige Series. But unfortunately, after that crash in the Namur World Cup, not able to take the start to today. And he goes into today's race. Lawrence Swake second with 59 points to Tonarts is 60 points. So it's very tight at the top of the standings. Quentin Herman's third in the series uh, overall. Uh, Ellie Isabit fourth with 54. Lars van der in fifth with 53 level with Corne van Kessel there. Tom Pidcock in seventh with 47. Jens Adams, Yanni Vermeersch and Tim Malier all up there in uh, the top 10. It's quite a good contrast I think in the series now Helen between the, the DVB trophy which is done on a cumulative time and the Super Prestige series which is a little bit more traditional uh, where you're just chasing those points all the time. But it's it's a shame after that crash uh, for Tone Arts not to be able to uh, take the start. Yeah, this is a real disaster for Tone Arts and the Super Prestige. When it's done on time, it's actually it's not so bad if you miss a round. He missed a loon out um, and you only lose five minutes, which sounds like a lot, but there are quite a lot of time gaps anyway. Um, but yeah, for the Super Prestige, there's only one point really difference between... I think third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh. So if you lose 15 points, it's almost impossible to get those back. But, you know, at the end of the day, Tunarts needs to be good for the national championships. He wants to win that again. He wants to be good for Worlds. And you can't just push on with four broken, <laughs> four broken ribs. Yeah, it's pretty legendary. Now, something I want to touch on is uh, we, before we come to racing, uh, when the cameras are out and about uh, and riders are, are pre-riding the course, from time to time, we saw in Zonhoven with Tone Arts clearing some massive rocks out of the top of one of the sand dunes. And we caught some uh, some camera images of Sana Kant a little bit earlier on, pulling out here, Helen, some massive rocks um, that she'd <laughs> uncovered. Is, is it... Is it quite common as a as a pro to be out there? This is the best bit, the reaction. Yeah, I think she must have had a crash or something. Like she must have hit it with her front wheel and been like, "Wow, what's that?" And then stopped, gone back, and found these massive rocks. And they did actually send some workers up to the course, and they dug out a load of them afterwards. You can see them doing that now. So, they're, and they're big. They are big rocks. They're not, you know, not just little tree roots or something. And they're probably historically there from an old building or something. And because the course has been used for 37 years, not the same course necessarily, but, you know, you, you, they start, tend to move up in the surface. So, yeah. She got them to move them. I guess you can do that when you're world champion. <laughs> a bit like my back garden. I live in a Victorian house. Every time I try to do my garden, I'm digging out rocks like that. I think they must have buried <laughs> half a house in my garden. Now, one of uh, our uh, intrepid young reporter in between her races, Zoe Backstead, has been out and about here in uh, Deegan again today. And she had a chance to catch up with Tom Pidcock a little bit earlier on today. Let's hear from her now. And apparently we're not quite getting the audio on our uh, our interview with uh, Tom Pidcock. Super Sid will let me know in my ears if we if we uh, if we have that one. This race though uh, is is quite a traditional one here in Deegan. The the night race as as this race goes on, the the party really really gets going, doesn't it? It really does. It's one of the best spectator races for sure. As a rider, it's not always the best. Um, there's an atmosphere that it's quite hard to like move around and things like that, but. Um, yeah, it's as a spectator, it's the light, the beer, the crowd, the noise, the smells. It's it's something really quite different. There's actually a lot of talk tonight on the television about um, contracts and things changing. Um, and Sven Nace was saying that Cornelia and Castle um, and Quinton Hermans don't necessarily have contracts with Telenet for the next season. And Wanty Pro Cycling, I think they're changing to a different team, but they're wanting to bring cross riders in. So there's the buzz of the, all the managers around and, and everybody goes to this race because it's such a big race and, and things like that get discussed. So it's a really good race. I'm here watch, with... Sure. Um... Now, well, let's have a look at the start list uh, for tonight. And uh, Helen, with the with the likes of the real inform uh, Tone Arts not here tonight, it's uh, it's difficult to look beyond uh, Matthew Vanderpool in a, in a race like this, is it? 
It really is. Matthew's very fast. And even in the super fast Zolda, um, we saw him just on the third lap. They had a crash at the finish line and he said, OK, boys, I'll see you later. And, and off he rode. And so it's kind of um, for him in this race, even though we've seen group racing in the other races, um, Thibaut needs to be fair won by a really long way in the juniors. So it's it's not necessarily just group racing when you've got the talent of Matthew van der Poel. Let's go down. I think we've got live pictures. We can go down to the start line. Don't forget, subscribe to GCN. Uh, build more live cyclocross here on the channel. Just hit that subscribe button. It doesn't cost you anything. It just means you're uh, joining our community. You're following us. You can hit that bell icon and uh, you're notified when we upload a new video. You can schedule your broadcast as well. You'll get a notification with about half an hour to go. Uh, before uh, we go live on a broadcast. So we'll, uh, we'll go down to live uh, pictures on the start line. And uh, we are off and uh, racing. Apologies for that. We just uh, missed them off the start line. Quentin Herman's there racing away uh, from the start. Gets a good start there. So does Matthew Vanderpool. There's Tom Pidcock just uh, moving up. Uh, Jadenek Stibar, you can see they're wearing 18 from uh, De Kernick Quick Step. Hermans leading out here, Lars van der Hart. As, uh, David van der Poel just tries to get up here as well. Uh, Tim Malier could be a good course for him today. Marcel Meissen uh, very much up towards the front. Stephen Hyde getting a very good start there from uh, as Curtis White, my apology, uh, from Cannondale Cyclocross World, uh, dot com. So a good start for Curtis White, and you can see just how big this field is here. 113 riders we have in uh, total as we're on to this off-camera section, and it's Lars van der Haar that's leading out here for the Telenet Bauer's Alliance. Tom Pidcock drops down to the bottom of uh, that section. There's a few riders, Joris Neuvenhaus just going through. Janny van Meersch. Jadenek Stivar just getting delayed a little bit. I remember there's Cameron Mason at the top there for Trinity Racing. I think one of the standout moments of this race last year for me, Helen, was Cameron Mason dive bombing Jadenek Stivar on the on that section. It was one that they went back to see him, and it was that that moment where Cameron really caught our attention. Yeah, that was uh, David Conroy, the Irish national champion, just uh, being a struggle for. Uh, Oh, for Stybar, sorry. We've seen the Americans just missed his pit man. He obviously had a problem. He's had to go back into the pit. As we saw with Sheeran in the women's race, that this when you have a separate pit at the bottom of the course and a pit at the top of the course, then um, it can be a bit of a problem for some of the riders because it's so rare nowadays. It is indeed. Matthew Van der Poel, this is an ominous sight uh, here. The world champion already taking off of this opening lap. Cast your mind back 12 months. And Matthew Van der Poel, it was this race where the uh, wayward marshal got in uh, his way. Tim Malia just trying to close the gap up to Matthew van der Poel. David van der Poel just coming through next. Ellie Isabitz is up there. There's Tom Pidcock just going uh, through your picture. Good to see Curtis uh, White. He's there. Gage Hector's here as well wearing uh, 71. Van der Poel kicking on at the front. This is uh, on the opening lap. You can see the gaps already starting to open. There's Ellie Isabitz. It is. Matthew's this very is, fast. This is an impressive start to the race for uh, Matthew, who's already trying to put the pressure on and separate that group. I guess when you have that many riders in a, in a race, you really don't want to get in any trouble at all. But it's good to see Tom's back racing again. He missed um, Zolder and Lunau, um, and he's back now, and he'll be really good at this race. It's a fast race. Um, so for him, if he can hold wheels, it should be really good. And like we saw the younger riders in the women's race, they benefit from things like this. There are, there's there's Michael Michael Van der Steve going through. There's uh, going through Stephen Hyde just going uh, through your picture. When you've got someone like Jadenek Stibar in uh, the race, it just means that the cameras pan back a little bit further. I'll try and run you through some of the riders. I, I do try and highlight uh, some of the non uh, Dutch Belgian riders for our international fans, but there's an, an awful lot of them today. Stephen Hyde, we saw Michael Van der Ham from Canada, Sasha Weber from Germany, We've got Christian Cominelli from Italy, Gilles Mottier from Switzerland, we've got uh, Junquera from Spain, uh, Cameron Jette from Canada, uh, Andrew Janet, I think I got corrected the other day on the pronunciation of Andrew Janet's name, uh, Henrik Albrus from Norway, from Asker, Stephen James from Hope Factory Racing from Great Britain, 
You've got Ben Turner, Jakob Dorogoni from Italy, from Celitalia. Uh, we've got Thomas Kopecki from the Czech Republic. Ben Tullet from Coronet Circus is in there. Tony Lebel from France. James Magwick from Great Britain. Jonathan Ostland from Sweden is in there. Good to see the Swedes represented here tonight. Joe Taylor from Great Britain from Avid Sport. Albert Poble from Spain. We've got uh, also in there from France, go to Jemez, Patrick Mersch from Luxembourg into the sand section. Ellie Isabet leading out here. We've got Mel, uh, Miguel Correa Morera from also from Luxembourg. We've got Miguel Lanetta from Spain. Loris Tursi, uh, Kevin Dalla from Italy, Max Judelson in there, Lawrence Rigue from Switzerland. Lane Mayer was the rider that we saw, I think, having a problem in the pits. Eric Bruner is our US rider. Sam Knoll is also there. David Conroy, Helen Mention, Cameron Mason, Toby Barnes from RST. Alex Morton from the US national team is in there. Raphael Kockelman from Luxembourg. Brody Sanderson from Canada. We've also got Callum McLeod from Canyon DHB Bloor Homes. Lewis Askey from Zanata. Malcolm Barton from Canada. We've got uh, Cyprian Gilles is there as well. Axel Lawrence, Joe Williams from Aspra, Friend Mansfield, Harry McGarvey, Ryan Middlemas, Tyler Loftus, James Clark, Tom Cousins, Maxim Gagne. We've got Lucas Mortzel and uh, Elias Nielsen from Sweden and Clement Guilbert. That's the whole field um, here tonight. So I hope I've given a good shout out to your riders from your country. There's lots of different uh, nations represented in here this evening. Matthew Van Poel, Quentin Hermans and Ellie Isabet leading out here. This trio of riders at the front and then a small gap back to Tim Merlier and then uh, back to Michael Van Tornau and Joris Neuvenhaus. Yeah, with Tom Pickock in that second group. Um, again, you'll see a lot of the road riders riding really strong in this race because, as we said in the women's race, that there's one and a half kilometers of road or gravel um, of a three and a half kilometer circuit. So it is quite hard to get gaps um, and it's quite good to sit in a group as long as the group's going fast enough and there aren't too many riders. Three riders is a lovely sized group. Eight riders is uh, too dangerous. Indeed. So they Back to that chasing group, Corne Van Kessel. Corne had a great ride in uh, Leuenhout. This trio. Leading out here, the uh, general classification, Quentin Herman's third, Elizabeth is fourth with 54. That race in Luan out though, Helen with uh, Matthew Vanderpool got delayed at the start. I, I would love to hear the internal dialogue that went on with uh, Elizabeth when Vanderpool got, got up to him um, at that the late part of the race. Yeah. Uh... Yeah, I mean, Elizabeth historically hasn't been the strongest mentally. Him and Tom Pickock have massive battles in the under-23 races, but this year I think he's come of age. So it was interesting to see on that corner but, uh, previously that Elizabeth decided to jump off and ride, run around. Oh, crash there for Quinton. Um, um, and just digging in, trying to get out there. And you saw that the other riders rode around the outside, but... Um, I've actually been informed that everybody's riding Griffos tonight, so they're on an intermediate tread, they're not on a mud tread, which means that when you get to a really slick corner and the temperature starts to drop and you get the dew point on top of that, sometimes it's quicker to run. Your minimum speed is your running speed. As they go through the line at the end of lap one, seven minutes and uh, 32 seconds on to lap two. So it's Vanderpool, Malir, Van Kessel, Pidcock, Hermans, Van Turen out, Van der Haar going through in eight, ten seconds. David Vanderpool in ninth. Laurence Swake are running out the top ten there at 14 seconds. Then Joris Neuvenhaus. Elisabeth and Van der Poel up. That, uh, just that corner before the steps, Helen, we saw a few riders go down there in the women's race. It just seems to be a bit of a, a, a really deep ditch just getting carved out um, as they go into that corner. Yeah, in the previous years where we had mud, that was really rutty and um, quite always quite cut up. I think it's just under some trees, and so it never really dries out, so it's just a bit boggy. And you try to go in with as much speed to try and get out the other side, but it doesn't always work out that way. Oh, that's a bit of a... He saved that well. Elizabeth saved that well, <laughs> but dropping down that line so low is a bit of a disaster. You can see so you're you getting really posts. close to the tape there as well as you get as the, you get dropped down into that section. It looks like Vanderpool almost uh, followed in by association there. Yeah, that top line is that it's more of an off, off camber than it looks, and that top line that if you fall out of that rut, then there's nothing keeping you up there anymore, so you just have to slide down the hill. So those, uh, they're just trying to get on Corny Van Kessel and Tom Pidcock about to get onto this uh, group. 
Then your chasers going through. There's uh, Van der Hart, Van der Poel, Swig, Neuvenhaus. Just trying to get in to uh, back onto that. Uh, this one, Tom Pidcock, Trinity Racing, British champion, right on the back as Ellie Isabet kicks over the top of the bridge. Great cable cam shot that we get down through here. If you're just joining us, welcome aboard. We are on lap two here on the night race in Deegan. The crowds are out in force as Malia just loses his uh, foot there on, the, on that corner. Just has to dab, but manages to keep momentum and uh, not lose too much to those riders just ahead of him. As uh, we'll say, the uh, Helen, they once a lot of people asking on our chat how, how many laps. So we, we tend to do the, the first couple of laps, then the officials just sort out uh, the length of the race, but generally about an hour. Um, the rule is that an hour. In World Cups, it has to be more than one hour. Um, but in other races, they base it on the first two lap times and then they tell you, they calculate how fast you're basically going to go. And that's what your laps are. So in the women's race, we saw five laps and they did 43 minutes because they were doing around eight minute laps. In the men's, um, we would probably see about seven minute laps. So um, that would mean roughly 10 laps, I'd say. Your leading group now is uh, swelled in numbers. Can Michael Van Toren out just get this uh, next group back into contention? Swait, Neuvenhaus and Vermeers are not far away from that group. It'd be good to see a big, uh, big size group just get together at the uh, head of the race. But it's Isabit and Pidcock as Matthew Van Der Poel just moves up on their left hand side. Pidcock tries to react as Tim Malia does the same and gets onto the wheel now of uh, the world's champion. It's brilliant to see so many riders represented at the front of the race from different teams, whereas normally we see as a bit of a teddy net versus a uh, power thousand. Is indeed out of that corner onto this little bank section as we go into the woods. That was Cameron Jette, the uh, Canadian rider that uh, was having a bit of an issue on that corner. That little bank, it looks quite deceptive, Helen, from uh, when you swing left up that bank. But it, it seems to be tonight, just it does pose a few riders a, uh, a few issues. It is. It's a, it's a lot steeper than it looks. And with the top surface getting a little bit of the dew, it's hard underneath. But... Um, it will get slippy and like I say with the tyre choice that they've chosen, they've chosen it based on the fact that a third of the course is road. They haven't chosen it on the fact that a couple of the corners might be a bit slick. So they just have to adapt how they're riding and because these guys would have ridden um, earlier in the day as well, they would have pre-ridden before the women's race so it would have been dark but it wouldn't have been as cold. They wouldn't have had the same conditions as they're experiencing on the first lap now. It shows the temperature when you see Matt, again, we saw it in the women's race with Sana Camp, but when you see Matthew Vanderpool and Ellie Isabet and the like all wearing, all wearing leg warmers as Vanderpool just opens up a small gap out, out of the sand. Yeah, definitely. The, um, you can see the sand pit, they've actually raked it between the races because there's not a single line on the left-hand side of the riders. Um, it, according to the Belgian weather, it's um, around zero to one degree right now. Um, and overnight it will be about zero degrees so it was probably four or five earlier in the day when they were riding and now it's it's changed a lot but everybody feels the same um so <laughs> you know you just put leg warmers on warmer gloves <laughs> and uh, ride harder i guess <laughs> unfortunately we didn't get to show you it but the sand pit they had cy the cyclocross the equivalent of a zamboni out in the in the sand pit they had a they had a they, they had a, a sort of digger out and there there was almost raking and hoover in the sand a little bit earlier on haven't seen that yeah, before the riders don't really like it when you do that because during the day you put in these really good lines and then someone comes along and takes them out again <laughs> and then the first <laughs> time on the first lap when you approach it it's really hard to actually get a good line again because yeah because as the day goes on the, those lines just get carved out deeper and deeper and you tend to see you'll have one line down the left and one down li line down the right and that's that's all, all you've got but we we do see a gap now you know, opening up Matthew van der Poel just kicking on at the head of the race just trying to open up now an advantage it's just a little early testing attacks here from uh, from van der Poel that's a good vantage point in the in the house <laughs> once a year you get to see a corner of the race <laughs> <laughs> It is that that how that's got to go up in value, isn't it? In Belgium, when you when your house has got that sort of uh, vantage point, I have potentially. Yeah, it'll be interesting to see what happens in this corner now with Matthew in front. 
Oh, Ellie gets off as well, yeah. So you can see actually the back wheels of the riders are just spinning a little bit as they try to accelerate out of the corner. And that's showing that it, the top surface has just got that little bit slicker um, from pre-ride till now. David van der Poel just slides out. You saw Pidcock do the same. He's a bit just uh, didn't lose uh, too much to Matthew van der Poel with that uh, little dismount there. Malia just st stands up tall as he goes over the top of the bridge. There she chases Van Toren out, Van Kessel, Malia and uh, Pidcock. But they're allowing, giving Matthew van der Poel the opportunity as he's a bit uh, has to come to a halt there. Everyone's got a dismount. And it's always an ominous sign, isn't it, when Van der Poel just has that look on it, look on his face, and uh, he will be smarting slightly from the the race issues that he's had over the last couple of races, and look to come back and just really uh, stamp his authority on the on the race right from the front. Matthew Van der Poel is such a strong rider. That's just raw power getting through that mud section, nothing more. Um, and uh, Isabel's back on his wheel before the finish line, but. There's only so many times that you can do that. So going through your line, 15 minutes and uh, three seconds at the end of uh, lap two. Three seconds back to the group containing Malir. The top 10 are separated by just 14 seconds. Lars van der Haar riding outside as uh, Malir sprints through that section. Hermans uh, remounts, so does Pidcock, so does Van Turen out. They've got to uh, get back on to those two leaders if they want to stand a chance of staying in uh, contention. There's Quentin Hermans just going through. David van der Poel, Lars van der Haar gets back on. Van der Poel looking ominous at the front here as they go on to this big off camber bank section rides that high line east of it has to dab the foot van der Poel nails it perfectly yet again yeah the uh ellie is a bit just back wheel just fell off into the bottom one and uh he had to put a foot down just to correct it sometimes that's what happens and matthew's so used to riding these skills so fast and that's what he's always done, that he doesn't know how to ride them slowly. And so when you see him in a group and being hindered, you see him quite often make mistakes. Whereas these other guys behind haven't had the opportunity to race with him at that level. And so are trying to learn how to ride his, his skills like he does, to be fair. Just holds that such high pace and uh, pressure throughout. When we were here 12 months ago, it was Matthew van der Poel that took the race from Michael van Turen out. Tone Arts was third. There was uh, 14 seconds back to Van Toren out. We had a standout ride that night. Tonarts was at 39. Lars van der Haar up there in fourth. Wout van Aert at uh, 56 seconds in fifth. A lot of you asking where Wout van Aert is. Just taking a, a steady Wout van Aert as he comes back into racing. Had such a great start at Leeuwenhout. He's just pacing himself. It'll be little by little uh, with Wout van Aert as he comes back into racing. Kevin Powers was sixth. Hermans was seventh. Neuvenhaus eighth. Swate was ninth. And Jens Adams. That was your top ten here a year ago. If you go back through the history of this race, you can go all the way back to Jadenek Stibar in 2008 that took it. Then there was back-to-back -back wins for Niels Albert between 2009 and 2012. Sven Nice in uh, 2013. And then it has been the Matthew van der Poel show since 2014. Uh, he is looking to go five from five here this evening. And at the moment, Helen, I'd say he's looking pretty good for it. Yeah, he's looking very strong for it. He also won it twice as a junior and once as an under 23, I think. So it's not like he doesn't know this course um, and it's not like it doesn't suit him. He's a, a really strong road rider as well as we saw in the um, Amstel Gold. So it's not like he doesn't know how to ride fast. It's just, he's just an incredible, incredible talent. And it is exciting to see when you're there at the race, you see this, how he rides things. It's just draw droppingly good. Um, when you're on television watching it, it doesn't seem quite as impressive, but in real life, when you see the de depth of the ruts, the um, the way he's riding things, the speed at which he's taking things, and his ability to just power through is just incredible. Ellie Isabit, oh, Van der Poel slides out there. Isabit's got a bit of an advantage. That cyclocross, if you're new to our uh, beautiful sport, that's what can happen, Matthew Van der Poel was looking like he was stretching this group and getting away then one slight slide and it hands the advantage to Elise a bit and gets through that muddy section van der Poel the power of the world champion though as he tries to quickly come back from that mistake let's have another look back at this he just seemed to turn a little too quick on that corner and back wheel slid out a bit 
I feel like his tyres are not quite. Um, he uses um, PDX, I think, and so potentially they're just not quite the ones that he requires right now. And maybe you, we might see him change bikes just to see if um, he can get slightly more grip. But he does love sliding around, so he might just keep <laughs> on them anyway. <laughs> isn't isn't Belgian uh, and Dutch cyclocross maximum slideability when it comes to tyre choice and, and pressure? It's just how much you can you can push the slidingness of your tyres rather than uh, how much grip you've actually got. When I used to ride this course, I used to ride um, a special tyre that was made handmade for me by Challenge, um, and it was a little bit like a chicane, so it had a kind of mud outside wall and a um, middle section that um, has a file tread. So when you're on the road, it's like riding a file tread, and then when you're going around the corners, you've got the grip of a mud. So um, the only problem you had here is in the sand pit, because in the sand pit, you need to get in the ruts and you need to flow through the ruts, whereas um, with that tire, it gripped on the edges. But it was brilliant for stuff like this, because you just felt like you could rail every corner, because you could just turn the bike in and the, the mud got the grip. Our two leaders, Matthew van der Poel and Ellie Isabet. Then you've got your gap back to Corny Van Kessel, Pidcock. We just saw going high on that banking. They did a little slow-mo there. Van Toren out has a glance back just to see where the group are behind. As uh, Helen said a little bit earlier on, it's most, it's mostly tarmac, this course. It's very much uh, a, bit like a, a bit like an urban cross. But this is what we need as well, isn't it, Helen, in terms of cyclocross courses that come right down into the town and, and everyone. It's just such a... I, I would say that apart from the guy who's on the course who's watching, from his house. I doubt there's uh, uh, very few people that are that are back at home this evening. Yeah, there's a lot of spectators. They're expecting 20,000 and you can't get to every section of the course so it makes it look like there's a lot more than there might be but they had 16,000 in Lunau and that's that's not a surprise and they feel that that was due to um, Wout van Aert coming out but this is such a traditional long-standing race that it could almost be like it, there were more fields, but they've built houses in the last 37 years, so <laughs> <laughs> there's definitely more houses than there used to be. <laughs> As we go back to that chasing group, comment from Kevin Perkins on the YouTube forum. No gloves for Pidcock, he must be thermonuclear. No, he's just from Yorkshire, isn't he? Well, some people, um, Steph, my husband, refuses to wear gloves in cold races, and he thinks that I'm weak when I did, but um, if it's really wet, um, the water stays on your, really close to your hands, so you don't want to wear gloves. But equally, um, just tonight, it's just cold, so if you get cold hands, wear gloves. If you don't, don't. Like, it's a personal choice. <laughs> your hands warm up after a while anyway, um, uh, when, you, when you don't wear gloves. Apparently so. <laughs> yes, they do. <laughs> That Isabit and Van der Poel, we saw the battle at Lone How Can Ellie Isabit uh, battle back today and take a victory the, with the anticipation when Van der Poel came back into racing after the dominance of Ellie Isabit earlier on in the season? In the end, it was Tone Arts that ended the winning streak of Matthew Van der Poel. And for Ellie Isabit, he's got a lot to prove. Um, hasn't he, Helen, in terms of going up against Matthew Van der Poel and proving that he's one of the best in the world? I think he does, but I think he's still got time to prove it. He is only first year um, elite. Um, I think that he he has uh, a lot to learn in battles, and Matthew van der Poel is very good at battling with other riders. So the more often that he can stay at the front with, with Matthew, the more often that he can learn how he rides, the easier it's going to be for him to learn how to beat him and what, where the advantage is. And, and Matthew does make mistakes. He did lose one race in the last, I think it's 34 or something. So, you know, it is possible to beat him. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> not, not very often, but the only way that you'll learn how to is if you race against these riders uh, and you're able to ride with them the whole time. As we do see Yanni Vermeer uh, going Vermeer. off here. Oh. That was a good save by Gianni Vermeer there. I think what uh, the likes of Ellie Isabit can watch here is when you just saw Matthew Vanderpool, the way he took that, that section there where he dismounted, grabbed the bike by the, the right hand, took a moment just to kind of almost just relax a little bit. Yeah, you can. Um, 
I mean, Ellie stayed on the bike there where Matthew didn't, and then in another place, Matthew is on the bike where Ellie isn't. So it's not necessarily, so your center of gravity can also affect how you can corner. And Matthew's a lot taller. Ellie's a little, he's not short, he's smaller than Matthew. Um, and so his center of gravity is different. So different points, you are different riders, but equally you can learn a lot from the people around you. Let's just give you a rundown of the riders that you're seeing in your top 10 as Elisabeth attacks Matthew van der Poel over the top of the bridge. They're doing the right thing here, the Pausausen bingo rider got a bit, real battle on her hands. So you've got van der Poel and Elisabeth, this is the lead from uh, this group just swinging backwards and forwards. That chase group behind has a few riders. Here's uh, Jadenek Stiba is uh, just going through your picture. I think that's Ben Turner that's right with him. There's Marcel Meissen, Joris uh, Neuvenhaus, so Jadenek Stiba. Uh, just uh, again just losing that back wheel just trying to ride the uh, the ruts there so you've got Pidcock, Van Kessel, Malia, Swaik, Van Turenhout, Van der Haar, Hermans and David Van der Poel that's your your top 10 riders it's kind of swinging backwards and forwards between the uh, the order of uh, those groups at this stage can they get back up to Ellie Isabit and Matthew Van der Poel it's Tom Pidcock that's doing the work now on the front corner Van Kessel Tim Malia right behind him Michael Van Turen out as a word with Lauren Swaik here maybe you're thinking that they need to do a, a bit of a job here to try and bring this group back up Pau Sals and Bingo maybe with Ellie Isabit in that lead feel that they want to have strength in numbers here to be able to dominate proceedings against Matthew. I feel like they might actually just be um, trying to keep the pace high but not bringing it back. Um, also, Lauren Sweek is very good in fast races and he had a bit of a disastrous start because he was way down in around 15 or 16th on the first lap. So he, Michael might be trying to work to bring him back. Um, they worked together really well in Zolder when um, uh, at the week, uh, a couple of days ago. So. I, I don't think they'd be bringing Ellie back particularly. I think they're probably just trying to keep the gap the same but not let the other riders bring up. Oh, yeah, well, you're in, they've just, just closed the gap, so. <laughs> <laughs> I was right for once. <laughs> that was interesting. It was an interesting move. We're seeing a lot more, though, this season. Would you say, Ellen, that the fact that teams are thinking, OK, we need to think of this as a team. We don't just want to let Matthew and uh, ride away with Ellie just in case. Uh, we see what Matthew does week in, week out. Of course you have to think about that, but equally, is it better for one of your team to be second than sixth? Because if you bring back all of these riders, your, your chances of that podium reduce at the front. Um, Lawrence Week is in second, like we said, in the overall, and so they may be well be doing that for him for tonight. Um, for the super prestige so if he gets he wants to get as many points as possible ahead of two nuts there's Tim Malia just going through your picture Pidcock just drops back down into that group Quentin Homer is just behind into the sand Van der Poel uh, always through the sand has that nailed so does Elise but as he exits the sand Corny Van Kessel gets rid of the glasses into uh, the uh, pits at the side on a race like this, Helen, where the, the temperature is dropping as the, as the night goes on, how much communication would you have between you and, the, and your pit crew and your mechanics in terms of as the, the night goes on, would you want the, to completely change your tyre pressures as it gets colder? You wouldn't necessarily want to try and change too much. If it rained, you would definitely be changing, but you'd already have um, a bike with um, that tyre choice in one of the pits, and you'd know... In, I mean, we didn't see that for Paul Sheeran, but you would know which pit, which bike was in and which mechanic had what. So um, if it got really wet, you'd change up to a, a more aggressive tread. If it, it wouldn't, you would always try to start on what you plan to finish the race on. Um, and so even though these guys are sliding out a little bit, they're now used to it and they've adjusted their speed and they've adjusted their line. So they would stick with the same tire choice, I think at this point, but everyone communicates with their mechanic and you hear your mechanic when you're in the pit, when you're going past the pit, it's almost like you filter out everyone else. Jadenek Stibar just going through the sand there. As he exits that section. There was a Ben Tullet just behind him, just two riders behind in the Corridon Circus kit. 
have been joined riding in the company of Genetic Stibar. We have a race on our hands this evening. If you're just tuning in, welcome aboard. We are in Degum. It's round six of the Telenet Super Prestige Series for the Elite Men, Matthew Vanderpool, Elise Witt, Laurence uh, Swake, Corny Van Kessel, Tom Pidcock and uh, Lars van der Haar uh, pretty much make up that group with Tim Malia. There's some gaps just starting to open now. Malia, Pidcock and Herman's just off the back as van der Poel turns up the heat yet again. Don't forget, give us a like on our live broadcast. Click that like, that all helps us. Make sure you subscribe to the channel as well. If you're enjoying our live free cyclocross action, if you subscribe to the channel, that all helps keep us going in the future so make sure you subscribe to the channel it's free it's just like a it's just like a like just like a follow it doesn't cost you anything you can hit that bell icon and then you're notified when we upload a new video you can schedule your broadcast and you'll get an email reminder about 30 minutes before we go live so that's a big help to us i think we've got about just under 20,000 viewers i think we're pushing 19,000 viewers here tonight on gcn racing so i hope you're enjoying our coverage make sure you give us a like keep spreading the word you're doing a wonderful job as cyclocross community Community here on the channel of letting everyone know that we are here. Matthew Vanderpool exits the steps at the top. There's Pidcock and Herman sprinting up there just to try and get back on as Vanderpool rips it through here. Lap four of eight, 30 minutes of racing and counting. Well, Matthew's trying to make a move there, isn't he? He's trying to, he's decided that there was too many riders there together and already from the steps to here, he's put five seconds into those five, right, four riders behind him. There's a no under 23 race at this race, which is why we're seeing uh, Pidcock's obviously racing elite the whole season, but we're seeing the likes of uh, Ben Tullet, who's 18, Ben Turner, all these riders. There's also, I've been asked to say happy birthday to Harry McGarvey, who's in this race, who turned 18 yesterday. <laughs> you got a feel for those guys. Turned 18 yesterday and he's racing Matthew Van Der Poel in a 110 <laughs> rider field. Do you think it's a detrimental move, though, for a lot of the under-23s when they're just kind of caught up in that big sort of washing machine effect that, that you have at the start when you've got 113 riders on the start line rather than racing in a smaller field where you're actually racing for that victory? Um, I think that it is, there's a balance. For under-23 men, they have a balance. They can race um, in their own races in the DVV trophy and also in the um, World Cups. So it's not like they don't ever get the chance to race each other. And they then have an opportunity to step up to races like this. And this is, they're not going into it going, well, I fucking hold Matthew Van Der, Peel's, Van Der Poel's meal, I can win. They're going into it thinking, okay, I'm going to learn stuff here. I'm going to see what, what this is about and what the difference is and what I need to do in the next four years before I become an elite week in, week out. Matthew Van Der Poel has really opened up a gap through that section. Look at the power of the world champion as he accelerates, drops that group behind. He made that move through the start and finish line. Here we go, the world champion. I mean, he saw that little move earlier on, a little bit of testing move, and they got back up to him. Now he goes on the offensive. The crowd are roaring on. Matthew Van Der Poel as he uh, bends the tape and bends the barriers, as Jeremy Powers says. This is what we saw him do a year ago, and look at that advantage that he is open after that big power move through the start and finish line. Powell, Sows and Bingo, they brought back Ellie Isabit. And as you said, Helen, there's such a gamble. If they had perhaps left Ellie Isabit out there, he might have just been able to stay with Matthew Van Der Poel. Now the three riders there, they've got to bring him back. They've got to chase it. They've got to work as a team. Well, if they'd left Ellie Isabit with Matthew, then they wouldn't have had to work so hard to get him back. But also, um, Matthew may not have attacked in the way he did because he only had one rider that he had to beat. And when you're you're racing one on one, Matthew knows how to beat Ellie Isabit. He's been him hundreds of times. So it's you know for. For the team, I feel that was probably not the smartest move. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see how they pull. We'll see how they pick apart this one if they can't get back up to it. But look at this now: the uh, Matthew Van der Poel just tucked down on the brake levers. We are on lap five of eight. It's time to make it count. Laurence uh, Swake, Michael Van Turen out, just moving up on the outside as he comes through. He was the rider uh, who uh, we said last year took second, 14 seconds behind this man. The Corandon Circus rider who's uh, really uh, started that second winning streak now. He's a very classy bike rider, uh, Michael Van Turen out, and he's very good at these kind of fast conditions as well. 
He's had a great season so far. Has uh, Michael Van Toren out, had some wins early on. And uh, Lawrence Swake as well. There's early ease of it. It's going to maybe be a little bit frustrated um, with the, the tactics of the team today. They've got some work to do. Van Toren out, has a glance back just to see where the riders are behind. Van der Poel pressing on at the front here. Can they get him back? Corny Van Kessel, the only rider in that group from Telenet Bauer's Alliance. There's Tim Malier right behind. Lars van der Haar, can he get back in here as well? Into the sand. Van der Poel getting uh, roared on by the crowd at the side. Has uh, so far the power through this uh, sand section. I was uh, just told that the uh, Jürgen Mette Penning and the, the director sportif of the Sal's, uh, Pals Salsen team is not happy about the move that they made. <laughs> they interview the uh, team managers on the television in Belgium and uh, yeah, he didn't think that was a smart move. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, you, you, you got to be brave. To, to make that you've got to make it count haven't you there's uh, there's nothing like uh, completely uh, throwing it away uh, when you've got a, a rider like Ellie Isabel who's up there and we saw in Lone House as well Ellie gave he gave us a good battle didn't he when Van der Poel got up to him yeah he gave us a really good battle I guess they are riding for the overall in the Super Prestige so um, it is making sense to bring Lauren Sweet back and so that's probably what the riders are, are working on but um, yeah maybe it would have been better to attack the group rather than to drag everybody up together starting to pick up some lapped riders just ahead of him is Matthew van der Poel they'll all be uh, pulled out here just uh, going through Harry McGarvey there the uh, British rider from Air Burners There's your chasing group, confirmation of your uh, graphic on your screen. It's Pal Sals and Bingo. They've got to try and rescue something from this one. Lars van der Hart. And then a little bit of a gap back now to uh, Quentin Hermans and uh, Tom Pidcock. This series so far, if you're just tuning in, it's Tone Arts that leads overall. That's going to change after Tone Arts broke four ribs in that tumble on the last lap in uh, Namur. Second place, Laurence Swake. We're thinking perhaps that was the uh, the thoughts of the teammates of uh, Ellie Isabet when they uh, brought the group back up to uh, their teammate. And this man, Matthew Vanderpool, Quentin Hermans, this man here, third overall with 55 points. And Ellie Isabet, fourth with 54. Corny Van Kessel is level with Lars van der Haar with 53. Tom Pidcock, seventh with 47 points. Jens Adams, eighth with 33. Yanni Vermeers, ninth with 26. Tim Malia is tenth with 23 points. Uh, just uh, picking up those back markers, the Super Prestige Series so far, all the way back to Heaton. It was east a bit from Hermans and Van Kessel into Boehm. It was Arts, Hermans and Pidcock was the podium on that occasion. Havre, east a bit, Van der Haar and Swake. Then the big man returned, Rudevorda, Matthew Van der Poel from Laurent Swake, Anton Arts, and then Zonhoven. Arts from Swake and east a bit back to the line at the end of lap five. Matthew Van der Poel, where he made his move a lap ago, and we go in to lap six of eight 37 minutes and 16 seconds of racing so far and the gap really has grown over the course of that last lap these guys are just going to start watching each other now there's three from the um power sales of the team so although they've just gapped them after the stairs as well so I feel like they're going to start watching each other they're going to slow down I think Matthew van der Poel's yeah just going to take more and more time out of them every lap now so the gap there, 22 seconds being opened by Matthew Van der Poel. Quentin Hermans there goes through the line, all leg warmers and gloves. Tom Pidcock goes through next, so still riding in ninth place. Corny Van Kessel had a standout ride. Corny Van Kessel in low and out was with Ellie Isabit for most of the race, got dropped, and then Matthew Van der Poel got back up to them after taking that uh, tumble on lap one, was about a minute off the lead, made it back to that front group. And it looks like he's going to uh, go five from five here in uh, this race. To add, as Helen said, also to the junior under 23 races that he's won here in uh, Deegan. 
This year, the under 23s in the Super Prestige are in with the elites in every round, but they have a, their own point scoring system, the same as in the women's race. And again, they have their own overall. Thanks for all your chat. Loads of you getting involved today. Derek Maguire, big shout out to the North Tyneside riders competing in the Cyclocross Northeast uh, League in Thorneyford tomorrow. Thanks uh, all of you for getting on board. A really successful league is that Northeast Cyclocross League. It is producing many, many uh, young stars. That aerial shot there, Helen, that beautiful tracking shot as Malia goes in for a, for a bike change. I was thinking it just shows that speed and how, you know, how quick Matthew Vanderpool is managing to, uh, to, to go round this circuit. Because when you look at it, it's not as wide as you would get if you were riding a Criterium. It's not, no, they, they're three metres wide. Um, but yeah, it's, it's not as wide as a road race, but it's still for cross racing because there's no it's just road or it's just gravel or hard packed ground it's no technical element that's meaning that, that it reduces the line so you see quite often that there's only one or two lines like there is in the sand pit and the same cocksider is basically a sand pit so in cocksider you would only see one or two lines for 90 percent of the course whereas here there's so much space to overtake um, apart from the start the start is the craziest start <laughs> <laughs> that 113 riders all coming into that narrow section right at the beginning Powell Sows and Bingo have made disastrous uh, tactic choices here after Elise a bit this man was away with Matthew Vanderpool they brought it back and Matthew Vanderpool went again the, the questions asked what might have been I know it's uh, probably a silly question to ask but could Ellie Isabit have stayed with Matthew Vanderpool as Helen said he might not have put in that second big attack if they'd left that man there with him your chasers Swake Vanderhaar and uh, Malia Swake definitely looks really uh, really really gassed here after those uh, earlier efforts yes yeah, Swake doesn't seem to be riding as well as he has in the last few races um, tonight again it does take it out of you and as we said normally it's Barbal that you see the big time gaps in because that's a really really tough race um, but here tonight the speed of the races has been really high of late when we've had fast races and so some of these riders aren't necessarily used to it but yeah you, you can have a bad day as well <laughs> you can indeed and uh, sometimes again with stage races three or four days in sometimes is when the legs can really really uh, start to bite and perhaps some riders just feeling that need uh, they might uh, do Braden tomorrow and then bar those are the races we got coming up here on GCN Racing we have the Etias Cross from Braden tomorrow we will be back for that one make sure you subscribe set a reminder for that that's uh, worldwide uh, excluding Belgium the Netherlands uh, Canada and the US unfortunately the ETS uh, those that series have done a multi-year deal we aren't able to get that for US and Canada but we are back on uh, New Year's Day with the next round of the DVV trophy from Baal and uh, just as equally as important the next round of the uh, the Helen 100 junior women's series in uh, in Baal on New Year's Day Yes, we do. And I think we've got about 50 entries for that so far. So that's really exciting. And then the final round is in Brussels on um, the 5th of January. Here's your chasers. It's a bit Van Toren out there. A little bit of gap now back to uh, Corne Van Kessel. I think Ellie is a bit might be having a word here with Michael Van Toren out to just uh, up the pressure on this one. Let's try and close that gap down. Swake definitely not looking comfortable here. You see the leg warmers, long sleeves, long fingered gloves for uh, Laurel Swake. Is uh, not looking happy. Gets uh, again. You see with Lauren Swake has uh, dismounts the dirty side dismounter for uh, Lauren Swake. Vanderhaar just running those uh, planks. Swake out of that corner carries that speed. Yeah, I wonder if you change there for a uh, tire choice, maybe, or maybe even a tire pressure, because there wasn't there, the bikes aren't picking anything up. There's no real mud on them. There's no. You're not mixing sand and mud, even though you are in the race. It, there's not sticky mud to collect the sand on your chain, so your drivetrain needs cleaning. So I think it's just uh, maybe a different tyre tread or a different pressure. Matthew Vanderpool wearing number one, wearing that rainbow jersey. When you uh, look at his cross season so far, started in Rue de Vorda, won that one, went over to European Championships, and despite having a, uh, a little Belgian train behind him, managed to take that one back to uh, Neil for the Yarmouk Cross, took that one over to Tabor for the World Cup, took that one. 
to the Flandering Cross in Hammer, then to the Ambience Cross in Wachtovike, one in Cox Cider, he won in Courtrike in that Urban Cross, then he went over to Mole, took that one, then the winning streak, 35 races, 400 days, came to an end at the GP Mario de Klerk in Ronser, but since that one, he's put all of that behind him, and despite some pretty epic races, he is now built, uh, he's building his next winning streak. He won in Overreise, he then won to uh, St. Nicholas, won that, went to that epic race in uh, Namur, the World Cup, took that one after a battle with Tonart, over to the GP Eric de Vlamink in Zolder, that World Cup, took that one, then to Leuenhout to the Arzen Cross, who were uh, already building uh, five races in total since that winning streak uh, came to an end. It's almost like Helen pressure was off. Time to start building uh, building the, the next uh, the next winning run. Yeah, I guess you're probably in uh, however many, 30, 38, is it? I guess you're probably allowed um, an off day once in a while. <laughs> 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 I mean, he's, he is just so good. Um, oh, uh, yeah, he's just so good that it's difficult for other riders to, to match him. Ellie Isabel, you can see, just drops down into that rut. Goes through at the end of lap six of eight here. So, ooh, uh, down there is uh, Corny Van Kessel and loses his footing in that uh, that section. You can see it's just being really gouged out, almost up to your uh, almost up to your hub there. Let's, really, let's have a look at this. Yeah, it's getting really deep in those sections and he's hit something, probably more rocks coming up if there was three or four before and then he's hit into the rut itself and uh, just missed his foot, basically. Takes a you bit can of see whack. Lars coming up. You can see Lars coming up behind him and how he's having to like just hope that the bike stays in one direction. You know when they can't pedal anymore that the ruts are deep. There's your order. Ace of it, Van Toren out, Malir, Van Kessel, Van der Haar goes through at 35 seconds. There, Laurence Swake is uh, your next rider back up to Matthew Van Der Poel. He will get the bell when he comes around next time onto this off camber section. Manages again to ride that rut over the top of that one. Drops down at the end of uh, that section. Very fast, very flowing course. Quentin Hermans uh, goes through. David Van Der Poel and then Tom Pidcock looking to just, just kicking some uh, dirt out of his uh, pedal as he goes through there in 10th uh, place. Back to ease a bit and uh, Van Turen out for Pal Sows and Bingo. I think... Uh, Team manager might be having a little bit of a word with these uh, this team after the uh, after this race tonight. Well, cyclocross is an individual sport. At the end of the day, they are in a team, and we have seen a lot of times Michael Van Torn out this year has helped um, Ellie is a bit. And then there was an incident in one of the races. Um, I can't remember which one where Ellie is a bit shut down Michael Van Torn out, and he got annoyed at the time on television. You saw they had a discussion in the race. Um, they both apologised afterwards, but sometimes that can affect teamwork as well. But yeah, it, it might have, they might have planned that to try and help Lauren Sweet, but Lauren was just not not there today. Not on it today. Van der Haar goes into the pits. Van Kessel alongside him. Uh, Jason Newman asking who's the Sunweb rider. That's Joris Neuvenhaus, is the uh, rider from Team Sunweb that's uh, in this race here this evening. Van der Poel lapping so quickly in uh, this race. Here's Genetic Stibar, so Dorigoni going through in 14. Stibar riding here in 15th uh, for Genetic Stibar. So that's a good a good uh, ride so far for Stibar. And again, the more, if you can start to pick up more UCI points, Genetic Stibar, that will help with his gridding as well, which uh, when you're as classy as him, then you, yeah, that makes such a difference. Yeah, it definitely will. The, the, most of the points are at the front of the race, though, so if he finishes 15th, he gets one UCI point, <laughs> which seems really disappointing <laughs> for all that effort. But, um, yeah, the biggest points are in the World Cups, and he's already done Zolder, so he'll have some points from that. National Championships, if he rides that and wins, which he's already, uh, already stronger than the other riders from his country, from Czech Republic, so um, he could get 100 points for that. That's a big... Uh, a big scout but it, uh, for, for Stobar it's more about the training it's more about keeping focused for the classics and this is really really good training for those guys indeed if he wins Paris-Roubaix now he'll be uh, doing a full cross season next year I think he'll uh, he manage to uh, persuade the team manager to let him do a full cross season I think if he uh, manages to finally get that on Oh, well, Roger Hammond always used to say that he loved doing the cross. He'd do like a short block of cross, 
but he'd always do it because it, it meant that he could test out how he was how his training was going it meant that he had a different focus but it also meant that over christmas he didn't have the uh the temptation <laughs> to get into all the things that normal people do at christmas <laughs> Yeah, I think most of us probably uh, ate the whole uh, the whole uh, food ration for every single bike rider that's been racing over uh, 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 in these races over Christmas. Yeah, we're not allowed for Christmas dinner. That's not that doesn't happen for bike riders. No, I say we, I'm it. not a bike rider anymore. <laughs> 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 I could have had one. <laughs> Van Paul into the sand. If you, uh, we will, he will come round next time and get the bell. Another phenomenal performance here from Matthew Van der Poel as he comes in to take a fresh bike for that uh, final lap. Don't forget, give our live broadcast here a thumbs up. That really helps. And also make sure you subscribe uh, to the channel. Ellie is a bit just starting to gap his teammate Michael Van Turen out behind him. He's a bit really uh, digging on here now for uh, Powell Sales and Bingo. Oh, in, if the race stays as it does now for the final lap, these guys will finish second and third. So um, ultimately, their team manager can't be disappointed with that. Um, it's a shame for Lawrence again, but there, it worked out in the end. Cross is such a uh, it's such a different sport in the way that it's you try to work as a team if you can, but it's so individual in who can do what, and so. If a rider just can't stay with you because their skills aren't matched or if they're just not strong in those places that you are, then it's really hard to actually help as you would on the road. There's your chasing group, Lawrence Swing, Lars van der Hart, Corny van Kessel, the riders out of that corner, Lars van der Hart, the only rider that uh, runs uh, that section. Van der Poel, daylight between him and the rest of the riders behind. Corridon Circus rider, as his brother, David van der Poel has got uh, Quentin Hermans in his sights. Tom Pidcock just behind here for Trinity Racing. So this will be another good top 10 for uh, Tom Pidcock. And there's, again, there's a huge amount of, of pressure and expectation on the, on the shoulders of, of Tom Pidcock. For me, his ride in Namur was absolutely outstanding. We've got, to be, we've got to be a little bit patient with Tom Pidcock, haven't we? He's still very, very young, and riders develop and mature at such a different rate. Absolutely. And Pidcock, I think that a lot of people in Britain have him down as a high hope. But equally, he's, um, he's very much of the personality that he can take all of that pressure. And he takes it really well and he deals with it and however he deals with it, it doesn't seem to affect him. So he wants what he wants in sport, in off-road and on the road. And I'm sure he will achieve everything that he wants to because he is that determined of a person. I just love watching how much fun Tom Pidcock and Cameron Mason have out bouncing around on the bikes as well. You see his videos as well out on his mountain bike. He's, when, you, when you think back as well to Matthew Van Der Poel, I mean, he's only sort of four years older than, than Tom Pidcock, but when he came into racing, jumping around on his BMX, Matthew Van Der Poel exits that section, manages to power through there that have, uh, the ruts of doom. I think someone was uh, just calling them over on the forum. There's so much chat going on, I can't keep up with this sort of who it was. But Van Der Poel now out of uh, that corner. He gets the bell this time. Another phenomenal performance. Van Toor now and uh, Isabet are sitting in second and third. Van Der Poel goes through here. 52 minutes and eight seconds of a racing. I think we're going to have a race under an hour here. Yeah, sometimes you, you get that and that, that's perfectly acceptable because it's it just says one hour, it doesn't say a minimum of. It's only in women's racing that it has to be a minimum of 40 minutes and a maximum of 50. So he's a bit of 14, holding the, that gap, closing slightly. Van Turen out at 20 seconds. He's a bit really is putting in a charge. Here's uh, Tim Malia from Griffin Freestadt, the, the Belgian road race champion. Tim Malia, real powerhouse is well he's uh, riding in fourth place 37 seconds down ellie's doing a good job here he's getting a good measure he's pushing van der poel van der poel cannot sit up or uh, sit back on his laurels at all no i mean if another spectator steps out like they did last year then <laughs> then that becomes a problem but at this point in time matthew is um just calm controlled 14 seconds is a lot on a fast course um, he knows that he's he's fine he just has to ride fast and to be fair to him he's he's not great when he rides slower he doesn't 
he doesn't seem to be able to do the skills as well. It's almost like he only knows how to do them fast, so he'll just keep pushing on. And he's obviously saving something. He's racing Grenade in a tomorrow, which is the first, I think the second time he's ever done that race. So he will want to win that as well. So, you know, at this point, he's got 14 seconds. You just keep everything under control, but you don't need to win by a minute when you've got another race tomorrow. Indeed, out of that corner, Michael Van Toren out chasing down his teammate. A beautiful cable cam shot here of Van Der Poel out of the saddle, up onto the big chain ring for Van Der Poel, right down on the little sprockets at the bottom as he pushes this course to the absolute limit. The crowd out in force here in Deegan. If you are just tuning in, welcome aboard. This is the final lap here this evening at the Telenet Super Prestige Series from Deegan, the night race under the floodlights. It is something special, isn't it, Helen, this race? It really is. The noise is incredible. The smells are incredible. The freight wagons, the burgers, the cigarette smoke, cigars, the beer smells. It's just a. Uh, and as you go through areas like this where there's beer tents and everything, it's just loud. You can see how many rows of spectators there are shoved around the course. It's, uh, it's something special for spectators for sure. Van der Poel uh, back to the front. Can uh, Van Turen out uh, get back up to Isabit? Give us a bit of a sprint between the Pau Sals and Bingo riders behind. Here's Isabit out of the saddle, really uh, attacking this course. Is Ellie Isabit uh, doesn't hide his uh, doesn't hide his uh, his emotions, does he? El Ellie Isabit in the way he rides. No, he wants to ride harder. Some riders have yeah pain faces. Other riders don't. Um, it just is what it is. But these two uh, have stayed away from the other they, they gapped the other riders and then Ellie is a bit gapped Michael and it's just kind of stayed like that for now but I think uh, I do think that they could possibly have done it different at the beginning but equally it would come to the same result indeed he's looking at Absolutely phenomenal, isn't he, Matthew Van der Poel? That off day, uh, off the back of that uh, training camp. And uh, back to our chasers, Laurence Swake, Lars van der Haar and Corny van Kessel telling that Bauer's alliance. Corny van Kessel, great performance that he put in in low and out. Lars uh, van der Haar has had a good season as well as uh, Lars van der Haar. Solid performances, but no one able to uh, stay with uh, this man. Again tonight, uh, we 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 hope that the beer out uh, offering the riders the, the beers that takes you back to the to the races in America, isn't it? Where they have a, they have a beer station. Yeah, they have uh, hand ups in the non UCI races. Yeah, it's actually illegal in UCI racing. So, um, <laughs> but I mean, it's really easy to to sit back and watch the race and say oh, well, why didn't uh, a rider stay with Matthew Van Der Poel when he did that? But when you're actually racing, these guys are trying their absolute hardest to stay with him. He really is just that something special. But, again, but when you put it into perspective and you look at the race, you, 12 seconds, 13 seconds, and we see Van Der Poel out here, time trialling behind, but look at Ellie Isabit, just to, the gaps there, 12 seconds when you're sitting behind rider who everyone is saying is that is a once in a generation kind of rider it's an absolute joy to watch when you're sitting 12 14 seconds even behind him that in itself it, it puts into perspective the the level of the of the riders chasing behind yeah and these guys have really raised their game this year as well because last year it was just Wout Van Aert and Matthew van der Poel and nobody was anywhere near and this year to be a lot of races particularly the fast ones you know the riders are within 10, 15 seconds, and we saw that incredible battle until that final horrible crash with Toon Arts in Narman. And so riders are coming close to him. They're just not consistently every week as good as he is. This is good to see Lauren Sweek attacking the Lars van der Haar and Quinton Hermans there because he really wants as many points as humanly possible. And from this point, it's quite hard to come past riders, although not going to tell you the result of the women's, but we did see that happen. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no spoilers for the women's race if you uh, want to go back and watch that one a little bit uh, later on. Thanks to all of you for getting on board today. Thanks for checking in here on GCN Racing. Another in incredible performance here. Masterful riding from Matthew van der Poel. Is, uh, going to, uh, he has won this race every year since uh, 2014. And uh, Niels Albert, four times winner of this between 20, 2009 and 2012. Ellie Isabit, he was with Vanderpool. The teammates got back up to him and uh, 
Vanderpool, he went again. If you're wondering the times for tomorrow for the Etias Cross from Braden, we we're, uh, we're usually live from 12.30, and we have both uh, races bringing those uh, to you live. The roar of the crowd. Listen to it. It's Vanderpool. Here we have. We haven't had a showboat yet this evening, and uh, that's what we were waiting for. Yeah, there was his little showboating moment. I mean, that, to be fair, there's probably not a lot of places where you can get enough speed up to do that, so <laughs> good on him. <laughs> Nicely done there by Matthew Vanderpool. Early use of it is absolutely uh, emptying the tank here to try and uh, close the gap as much as he can to Matthew Vanderpool. Gives us that special moment over the top of uh, the bridge. As uh, you can see, that gap still holding about the same sort of level. He's uh, into this muddy section. He's not far away from the steps now. Makes no mistakes uh, through that section. Runs up the steps at the bottom of the straight. And he'll remount. Here comes Elias of it. Manages to ride through the corner right to the foot of the steps. Another exceptional performance. We are watching something special in the sport of cyclocross from Coronet Circus. The rainbow jersey, Matthew van der Poel, sits up and celebrates 59 minutes and 42 seconds of racing. Eli Isabel, another good performance from Isabel, crosses the line there in second place. And behind him, it should be his teammate. Here he is, Michael Van Turenhout of Bausausen. Bingo, closes the, that gap down. He brought his teammate up with him, Lawrence Swick, earlier on in the day. Bausausen, Bingo, though, managed to round out to the podium in second and uh, third. Van der Poel makes his way to the, uh, the seats as Tim Malia comes in for fourth place, just ahead of uh, Lars van der Haar. Van der Haar, I think, will be happy with that performance tonight. And then comes uh, Lawrence Swaik. Uh, I think he'll probably be glad that's over tonight. Yeah, potentially, although he has, I would imagine he's taken over the lead of the Super Prestige. So um, there's always a, a good day. You, you can always take something good from a bad day, sorry. <laughs> Courtney Van Kessel riding in now for seventh place this evening here in uh, Deegan. Let's uh, see our uh, next riders on the top ten. One minute and nine seconds. Here comes Quentin Hermans. He's going to ride up the home straight here for eighth place for Quentin Hermans this evening. A little high fives to the crowd as they come in. We're looking down that straight, so two more to uh, round out our top ten here. Don't forget, give us a thumbs up on our live broadcast. Good uh, ride here from David Vanderpool today. So uh, first and ninth for the Vanderpools today. I think based on the points that Ellie Isabet might be up into second as well from his ride today, and it would be close as to who actually gets the lead of the Super Prestige. Could be tight. Tom Pidcock from Trinity Racing, British champion. He's, uh, it's going to be 10th, but well, he's going to have to uh, gas it up the straight a little bit. I think we're going to hear from uh, Matthew Vanderpool as Tom Pidcock comes in. Pidcock crossing the line for 10th. Tot op het einde. Uh, ja, ze hebben ik jou niet makkelijk gemaakt. Nee, zeker niet. Het was uh, eentje op karakter. Ik had daar niet, uh, niet echt de beste dag vandaag. Maar ik uh, heb al een beetje ervaring natuurlijk in Dichem. Dus ik kan het parcours heel goed indelen. Ik denk dat dat vandaag wel een deel van mijn overwinning is. Je hebt een paar dagen geleden gezegd, ik heb niet het flitsende van vorig jaar. Is dat hier dan bijvoorbeeld een getuige van wat we dan vandaag gezien hebben? Excuses, want ja, je wint natuurlijk. Ik bedoel, het is perfect. Hè, maar we zoeken maar naar iets. Ja, daarom. Maar ik bedoel, uh, iedereen weet dat het gevoel voor mij heel belangrijk is en uh, ik vind dat ik vandaag weer voel inderdaad dat het vorig jaar toch allemaal net iets vlotter ging natuurlijk, maar uh, ja, ik, uh, het is niet erg als je nog steeds kan winnen natuurlijk, maar uh, het was dus toch eentje op karakter vandaag. Waarom ben jij ontplopbaar in die gang? Je bent op vele parcours ontplopbaar, maar deze reeks steekt er wel bovenuit. Maar, ik weet het niet, ik denk dat het parcours me gewoon heel goed ligt. Dus, uh, ja, zoals ik zeg, als je een beetje door hebt hoe je hier je inspanning moet verdelen, dan, uh, is het, um, ja, is het wel uh, leuk om voorop te rijden. En het is gewoon een cross dat ik ook heel graag doe. Dat is zeker over heel veel crossen in de kerstperiode. Gewoon, uh, dat de sfeer altijd zo leuk is. En ik vind dat als renner toch wel extra, extra bemoedigend. Dus neem je breiden er nog maar bij morgen? 
Ja, ik uh, wou dat eigenlijk lang doen, maar blijkbaar had ik nog geen contract. Maar dat is nog in orde gekomen, dus uh, ik ben blij dat ik morgen terug kan rossen. Zijn dat jouw oudejaarsplannen? Of heb je nog uh, gezellige plannen met de familie ook? Uh, niet echt, ja. We hebben op 1 januari ook altijd cross natuurlijk. Dus nu, jaar 4 zit er bij ons nooit echt bij, maar daar geef ik niet zo heel veel om. Dankjewel. Gefeliciteerd, Mathieu van der Poel. We gaan verder met de nummer 2, met Eli Iserbit. Eli, um, waar so Matthew van der Poel said that he didn't have the best day that he's had. Um, and so he actually was quite happy that he was able to win. Um, he said this year he doesn't seem to have the speed that he had at this point last year. And that's something that him and his coach are working on. And um, he also said that um, he, they asked about New Year's Eve and he said no, he doesn't do anything because of racing, obviously. The kant die van jou was net iets minder. En dan ontstaat het gaatje. Maar jij bent ervan overtuigd dat je er wel weer naartoe had gereden. Ik weet het niet. Ja. Op het eerste moment wel. Ik voelde me heel goed ook tot op het einde. Het was niet echt verval. Dus. Um, ja. Ik ga er niets over zeggen. Ja. Eerst, eerst over jouw cross zelf nog eens. Want ja, die was wel goed. En we hebben het in Loonout gezien. Ik heb het aan Mario de Klerk ook gevraagd. Plots ben je er weer. Helemaal vooraan. De Elisabeth van de eerste week en de eerste maanden, zeg maar. Opvallend. En goed? Ja, ik uh, ben wel content. En ik, uh, het is niet meer gewoon om echt een, een lange slechte periode te hebben. En, uh, ik weet niet hoe dat kwam dat in, in naam zolder ook in overheid iets minder was. Maar ik uh, ben blij dat ik net op het goede moment uh, het goede gevoel uh, gevonden heb. En, uh, het is nog een belangrijke maand voor mij. Alleen nog een belangrijke twee maanden. Dus, uh, maar zeker met mijn contractverlenging uh, heeft mij dat wel een beetje vleugels, denk ik. En dan even over het slechte gevoel. Je moet niet zeggen waar het dan precies fout loopt tussen jullie twee. We weten het ook wel, of we zien het ook wel aan de kant dat het tussen jou en Michael niet goed loopt. En dat is al een paar keer teruggekomen dit seizoen. Maar hoe moet dat nu verder? Jullie moeten binnenkort een BK gaan betwisten. Het is, uh, met Michael uh, heb ik geen probleem. Het is, uh, ik denk als ze de wedstrijd terug bekijkt, weten we wel wie dat in mijn wiel zit op welk moment. En, uh, ja. Dat zijn nog de signalen die wij opvingen aan de kant, dus uh, daar gaat het dan niet om. Dan waren het andere signalen. Nee, nee, nee. Dat, met Michael kom ik heel goed overeen en uh, daar heb ik geen probleem mee. Ik wil hem zelf nog iets langer meenemen, omdat hij uh, heeft ook al veel voor mij gedaan. En, uh, op het moment dat ik los uh, was, was het jammer dat die grote groep terugkwam, omdat ik uh, al wel voelde dat ik op mijn strook, en zeker ook bij Hoppen, uh, toch wat volle pond kon geven. Maar ik ben blij dat Michael derde is. Uh. Dus dan is het uh, dat andere rode hemd van de ploeg? Zeggen niet. Ja, ze niet zeggen is natuurlijk ook voor een stukje zeggen. Oké, okay, we gaan naar de nummer drie. En dat is uh, Michael van Toernat. Onze excuses, Michael, want we waren tijdens de wedstrijd een beetje verward. We dachten dat er een akkefietje was tussen jou en Eli, maar blijkbaar is dat er helemaal niet. Uh, nee. Overval je misschien een beetje met die vraag, excuseer. Ja, nee, ik denk het niet. Uh, ik denk dat het gewoon de bedoeling was dat we met, uh, met een paar van de ploeg vooraan raakten. En dan, uh, en dan zien we, dat we wat we voor elkaar konden doen. Maar ik denk dat Mathieu net... Uh, Net als er erbij komt eigenlijk net een, een uh, versnelling plaatst en well, dat was wel uh, het jammer van de zaak, anders konden we misschien wel, uh, wel iets voor elkaar doen. Maar nu uh, ja, was het eigenlijk een beetje uh, proberen om nou het gaatje kleiner te maken, maar ik voelde dat vandaag Eli te sterk was en ik had het moeilijk om, uh, om Eli bij te houden ook. En, uh, dus uh, ik denk dat, dat gewoon Mathieu vandaag weer de sterkste was en uh, Eli was sowieso de tweede sterkste in koers. En uh, dan heb ik me een beetje proberen om, uh, om bij Eli uh, wat handje aan te pikken. En, uh, en dat was uh, ja, de voorsprong goed genoeg op Tim om uh, die derde plaats veilig te stellen. Maar het verschil met Mathieu was niet eens zo groot. Bij wijze van spreken overbrugbaar. Hoewel dat op topniveau uh, niet zo evident is, lijkt mij. Maar goed. Ja, nee, ik denk dat Mathieu ook wel een beetje. Het is een parcours dat elkaar wel goed uh, bepaalde stukken elkaar ziet rijden. En uh, ik denk dat hij natuurlijk ook wel uh, misschien niet, niet vol een bak is geweest. Dus uh, dat hij ook wel een beetje gedacht heeft van uh, Mathieu rijdt morgen en overmorgen ook. Dus uh, dat zal zeker wel, uh, wel meegespeeld hebben. Dus, uh, ik heb vandaag weer best van mezelf gegeven en vandaag was het toch uh, nog lang geleden dat ik nog een keer poeien had en toen wel deugd. Maar er schort wat in jullie ploeg, Michael. We dachten eerst dat het nogmaals tussen jou en, en Eli ging. Onze excuses daarvoor als we wat gelanceerd hebben. Blijkt wat Eli ons net zegt, dat er tussen hem en Laurens wat misgaat in koers. Hij is ervan overtuigd dat hij bij Mathieu had kunnen blijven als Laurens niet op zijn wiel reed op bepaalde momenten. Voel jij dat ook als ploegmaat, dat het daar ja, spaak loopt? Goh, nee, ik heb vandaag uh, niet echt iets gezien. Eigenlijk, uh, ik was zelf ook... Er wordt niet over gesproken in de ploeg. Oh, misschien na, een speed na de wedstrijd wel, maar uh, ik denk dat Laurens en Eli vandaag goed in het klassement stonden en, en zij gingen uh, proberen om, uh, allee, om zoveel mogelijk punten uh, te sprokkelen nu dat Tonde niet bij was. Dus uh, wat aan mij ligt, uh, 
weet het niet, ik, ik heb niet, niet veel te zoeken in klasse men. Ik, ik heb vandaag gewoon geprobeerd om, uh, om, om voor mezelf ook nog een keer podium te trainen. En ik denk dat ik uh, er niet echt iets mee te maken heb, maar uh, ik zal misschien na de wedstrijd wel, uh, wel horen. Okay. Thank you, Michel and Paul. Maybe can you leave that So Eli Elizabeth said um, that he felt really, really strong today, and it was really good for him to be able to be back at the top after some poor performances in uh, Naman and Zolder. Um, and he, um, they asked him about Lawrence Sweek um, and about Michael Van Tornout bringing that gap back, and he said no. With Michael, he has no problem, and he wouldn't respond on Lawrence Sweek. So <laughs> interesting. Um, and then they asked Michael Van Tornout about the same thing, basically, and. Um, he said that Elizabeth was was really strong today, and um, he was really happy that he was up there. They tried to work for Lawrence, but Lawrence wasn't able to hold the wheel, so then it was just up to them to race, basically. Thank you, Helen, for uh, translating that. It's uh, it's always interesting. I love uh, I love it. You know, a little bit of beef going on in uh, in there as well. I love how the yeah. I love how the uh, the interviewer just keeps pressing. Let's take you through your top ten though here, Egan. <laughs> Matthew Van Der Poel, 59 minutes, 41. Isabit Van Turnout, Malir, Van Der Haarswijk, Van Kessel, Hermans, David Van Der Poel, and uh, Tom Pidcock is your top 10, the British champion there, at 2 minutes and uh, 23 seconds. If we get the general classification in the Super Prestige before, before we go off air, I'll, uh, I'll do my best to uh, bring that one uh, to you as well. We'll see how that race tonight has affected things. Helen, I think you've got to be slightly worried if you're out there and Matthew Van Der Poel said, I'm not quite going as well as I was <laughs> last year. And I'm looking at, I'm talking over with my coach as to why I'm not quite as quick as I was 12 months ago. Yeah, I mean, he didn't say he wasn't as strong. He just said he wasn't <laughs> as fast. So maybe speed is something they're going to work on in the next four weeks leading up to, to the World Championships. And he is the, by far the strongest for the National Championships. And it's literally what he can do at Worlds. But if he rides on a bad day and he can still put 14 seconds into his nearest rivals, then, yeah, I mean, <laughs> what are the nearest rivals going to have to do to get faster? Looking around that top 10 today, there was a few riders that, you know, I think that the, the, the corner of doom, I think, proved a lot of uh, problems for quite a few riders today. Corny Van Kessel, Tim Malia all had sort of issues around that corner just before the, the steps and, and the run up towards the line. It's quite an unusual finish, isn't it? But it's 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 a really, I, I love it. I think it's a, from a spectator point of view and in commentary, it's a, it's a great part of the course, the way we lead into that home straight. Well, one of the best things about cross is that you can have things like that before your finish line. And it means that you have to think ahead as to what part of the course is the most important for you to lead from. And I'd rather have it there than say in Nome where the steps are immediately after the start line. <laughs> um, but it, it does make it interesting and it does take in another element of what cross is and cross is being getting you and your bike the, in, to the finish line fastest, basically. And in terms of those riders that have raced tonight, and it, it, it's, it must be quite different in terms of, of your prep and how you come in to the race. But for those riders that are maybe starting to feel a little bit fatigued after such a heavy program, do you think a few might decide to maybe sit out Bradener tomorrow and save the legs for Baal? Yes, Bradener is not a series race. So um, a lot of riders will go for, for the start money, but... A lot of riders will go because they feel there won't be as many riders, so they have more opportunity for points, uh, particularly in the women's racing. But also, a lot of riders will just miss it because the Super Prestige is important, the DVV for Zekarin Trophy is important, the World Cup is important. And you have to remember there's an overall prize money, and, and each the winner of the overall series is €30,000. So if you're leading that, then yeah, of course you would skip Bradener because it's important for you um, to, to get that series. And the DVV trophy as well, of course, are done on a cumulative time rather than points, which makes it, you know, even more important just to have that little bit of extra freshness in those legs. Yeah, especially if you're not going to win it. You know, if you're Matthew van der Poel and you're going to win it, it doesn't really matter. If you're um, not, it's really, really important that no matter what your place is, that you keep that, that time as, as small as possible. OK, let's have a quick look back at what was a phenomenal uh, elite men's race right from the uh, the word go. And what an evening race it gave us. That was the uh, the start line images, Elie Isabit, alongside Matthew van der Poel. 
Man, it's a tough start, isn't it, Helen? The way this kicks up from the... Uh, it's quite deceptive from what it looks on, on TV. It's a slight uphill start, and then you really want to be in that first group because as soon as you hit these corners just here, you're, it just bulks up, and it's one person, maybe two people wide at the most. Everybody gets off at that point, and then and then the gaps start forming. And we saw this group form after around the end of the first lap. Tom Pitcock just trying to latch onto the back. Malia was there. And it then became a leading group of Ellie Usabit and Matthew van der Poel. At this point, we thought this might be the story of the race, but Powsells and Bingo brought it back together. Laurent Swake, the rider there that just closed up that last bit of the gap in that group also was Michael Van Turenhout. Lap four of eight, this was where Matthew Van Der Poel made his move at about half distance after that group had gone in along the side of the football pitch and that gap opened and it just stretched and stretched from here. There was your chasing group, Van Turenhout, Swake, Van Der Kessel, all in there it wasn't Swake's night but Helen again another exceptional performance from this man and this shot in particular just shows his power despite him saying that he was on a bad day he was absolutely <laughs> dominant and he performed to the best of his ability on that day and yeah there wasn't massive time gaps but it's a super fast race and he just rode away and then styled it out at the end we love a little showboating from Matthew Vanderbilt. Oh, we all wish for bad days like these. The world champion up the home straight. He has won this race every year since 2014. Five victories in a row here in uh, Deegan. He is absolutely phenomenal. And behind him, another great performance from El Yusuf, the, the man of the early part of this season. And third spot on the podium for Michael Van Turenhout. El Yusuf went into tonight fourth in the Telenet Super Prestige Series overall. There was your top 10 at the end of the race. And Matthew Van Der Poel from El Yusuf, Van Turenhout, Malir, Van Der Haas, Swake, Van Kessel, Hermans, Van Der Poel. David and Tom Pidcock, your top 10. Two minutes and 23 seconds separating. I still keep that. Oh, to have a bad day like Matthew Van der Poel. We, <laughs> we can only, we can only, it's something we can only just wish for, really. I mean, it shows how much he wants it, though, as he wants to keep, he, he's talking to his coach, well, that wasn't a good win. So, you know, let's make the next one an even better win. <laughs> let's go over to the podium. Matthew Van der Poel steps on to the top step here in Degum. Ellie Isabit in second place. Michael Van Torenhout there in third place. A good evening out for these guys. Van der Poel, again, just an absolutely top draw performance from uh, the world champion. I think he's a bit can take some, uh, can take some confidence from, uh, from Lone Howe and here tonight, Helen. He had a really good ride tonight. He was on Matthew's wheel. It was only when that group all came back to him that he wasn't in the right place when Matthew attacked. So I think he said he's really happy with how he was riding and he thinks that he was riding really strong and you could see that he still got second despite having to drop the group again so i think for um ellie he's happy that the narman experience is done and dusted that zolder he had a solid performance it wasn't amazing but it was solid and yeah he's lost the overall world cup but he's come back and now he's probably in second in the super prestige so you know, swings and roundabouts. He <laughs> is indeed showing some good resilience. OK, we're going to give you some highlights of the entire evening's racing. So if you don't know what, want to know what happened in the elite women's race, you can look away in uh, in about five seconds. We'll take you through the story of the day in its entirety. So if you uh, don't want any spoilers on the women's race. Deegan. Celine Del Carmen Del Rodo, Anna Marie Huerce, Yara Castellan, Inga van der Heiden were among those on the front row of the start, as was Magali Rochette from Canada. It was Celine Del Carmen Alvarado that got a great start for Corendon Circus. 109 riders in total taking the start on the, this evening's racing, including Pauline Perron Provo would gradually find her way through the field. Del Carmen Alvarado has uh, won uh, two rounds of the Telenet Super Prestige Series so far. It was really a race between her, Yara Castellan, 
And Anamari Hurst, Shirin Van Anroy getting onto the group. A disaster would strike the young Dutch rider later on in the race. Sarnakan and Inga van der Heiden both within striking distance early on in the race. Alvarado, Hurst and Castelline pressing on as uh, this group. Yara Castelline tried a few moves. Celine Del Carmen Alvarado really was bossing the front of uh, this one. Hurst, the best sprinter out of uh, this group. Alvarado was having none of it. It came down to a battle between the two as Castelline sprinted to try and get back on. They exited the steps and started the sprint for the line. Both got clipped in. Alvarado trying to find the power, trying to find the gears. But it was a straight sprint to the line, and it was Anna Marie Hurst that came through to take the victory in Dino Alvarado, settling for second. And uh, the European champion, Yara Castelline, a, a big uh, boost from that one for the European champion, back into some good form. Your top 10, Anna Marie Hurst takes it from Celine Del Carmen Alvarado and Yara Castelline, Van der Heide and Peters Azufi. Katavas, Kant, Lechner, and Rochette was your top 10. In the elite men, uh, Tonart, the leader, sitting out the and round six of the Telenet series due to the broken ribs sustained in Namur. It left it open for someone to take advantage and take the lead in the series overall. Lars van der Haar getting a great start for Telenet Bauer's alliance. Matthew van der Poel very much to the front. 112 riders taking the start. It came down to a leading group. Elias of it, van der Poel, Malir. And Hermans, Tom Pidcock getting on to the back of the group. East a bit and Van der Poel going clear, but some tactics from the Pal Sausen bingo team behind. Lawrence Swake was the rider that closed up the gap. He had gone into the night. Second in the general classification, one point behind Tonart. East a bit had been in fourth at 54 on lap four of eight with half an hour of racing complete. Matthew Van der Poel made his move and the world champion didn't look back. Kicking on through the flat uh, section of the course. Pal Sousa and Bingo had some work to do. Van der Poel would never be seen again as he uh, opened the advantage. Elias a bit was his chaser behind, was holding him at uh, 13 to 15 seconds throughout the race. The off a camber bank. Van der Poel had it nailed to perfection. Kicked out of the corners. Time for a bit of Van der Poel showboating on the final lap over the bridge. Up the home straight, winner since 2014, Matthew van der Poel makes it five victories in a row in Degem. Elise Witt would come in shortly behind, high-fiving the crowd. The Pal Sousen bingo rider, a good night out for him, would move up in the general classification. Good third spot on the podium for Michael van Toren out of Pal Sousen bingo. Your top 10, Matthew van der Poel takes the victory ahead of Ellie Isabit and Michael van Turenau with Malir, van der Haar, Swake, van Kessel, Hermans, David van der Poel and Tom Pidcock, your top 10. What a night's racing. I think it's got to be, Helen, one of my favourite nights of the year. I don't know. What's it like now uh, uh, from, a, from a spectator and a commentator point of view rather than when you were in there riding it? Um, it's definitely much nicer. Um, <laughs> in the, I, I wasn't one of my favourite races. It was too fast. There wasn't enough mud, basically, and uh, so I didn't do it very often. I think I only did it four years, and I was close. I was in a sprint with Eva Lechner for third one year, and I got fourth. So I don't really have happy, happy memories of this race. But I remember watching it a long time before, and uh, really enjoying watching it before there was a women's race. And yeah. I've watched the women's races since, and it does lead to really exciting racing. So from a spectator point of view, it really is one of the best races.
Well, I hope you enjoyed that as much as we did. Make sure you subscribe to GCN Racing if you're enjoying our free live cyclocross. If you get that subscriptions, we're trying to push 100,000 subscribers by the end of the cyclocross season. If you want more live cross, that really helps us. Give our live broadcast a thumbs up. We are back tomorrow for the Etias Cross from Braden. A big thanks, as always, to Helen Wyman for her fantastic insight into the racing. Have a great evening or day wherever you are in the world. We will see you tomorrow. Bye for now.